Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning. We are populating. <laughs> Hi, Edil. How are you doing? <clears throat> Hi, morning. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. We are already 12, and it's not even 10 already. <laughs> I think we can wait uh, for 10 to come and a few more minutes for the other colleagues to join. And more are coming.
Guarda se sono in un segnale. Hello, good morning, everyone. Morning. Hello, good morning, and welcome. Thank you. And welcome to everyone this morning, 14th of July. Mm -hmm. There are more colleagues joining. It's only two minutes past 10, so we can wait a few more minutes to see if other colleagues will be coming, and then we can start. We are at 20 right now, so. Good morning. This is Ali Tarmal from Zara University, Lydia. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. This is Khitam I from uh, the University of Jordan. Morning. Morning. And this is Hadili Asin from the University of Jordan. Morning, this is Vladimir Basisti, CRD of Global Ukraine. Morning. Morning. I see more, many more colleagues joining and welcome to the new ones which are joining right now. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lawit Abdekader. I'm from University of al Algeria. Good morning.
So I can see colleagues from Italy, from Cyprus, from Jordan, from Algeria, uh, from, uh, was it Hungary before or Ukraine? Sorry for my bad memory. It's very interesting already to have so many countries represented this morning. And Libya. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're 27 right now and probably I forgot to mention some other countries which are represented today but it's very nice to have such a participation this morning so it's uh, 6 past 10 um, I think we can start if you agree Probably more will join later during the webinar, but we are already many here waiting, so I think we can kick off today. And uh, I see also our director from UNIMED, Marcello Scalisi, has just joined. So I would give to him the floor to welcome you all. And then um, uh, there will be greetings from Halil Yassin from the University of Jordan and from Antonio Carella from the University of Salento. So please, Marcello, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martina. Thank you to all of you for your participation, in particular to our friends and colleagues, Adil Yazin from the University of Jordan and Antonio Ficarella from the University. Um, just a few words to not only to thank you for your participation in these webinars, but in particular for the, the the work that you are doing that is exactly in line with the, the expectation of UNIMED in the subnetwork dimension. The, the main idea of the subnetworks, as, as you know, is to invite our members to cooperate in particular priority, not only related to the Euro-Mediterranean dialogue, but talking and working in particular on common priorities, critical issues that are related to our communities, and to try to identify through cooperation of our members, potential solution, concrete opportunities of cooperation through projects, but not only projects are important, of course, but we have many other, many other possibilities in terms of cooperation and not only exchanges, exchange of ideas, but also why not mobility of our researcher, mobility of students, uh, common paper, uh, the main idea is uh, to try to underline that some particular priorities of our region, working together is the way to address solution to our um, policy maker, university communities, academics, researchers, and students. Um, the topic that you selected is uh, the critical infrastructure uh, for this, this subnetwork, this particular important in a period that, like we are living. And I, we have great expectation from your work. And I think that's uh, through uh, your dynamic participation, your active participation in UNIMED life, we will surely will have soon some concrete uh, opportunity of cooperation. Few information about UNIMED at the moment an important news. The, the next assembly will be, unfortunately, this year online, but we are working jointly with the University of Jordan to plan the next physical assembly in presence. I mean, in next year, in 2022, in springtime or summertime at the University of Jordan premises in Amman. Uh, the second important information that we just published at the report uh, as grasped by the Union for Mediterranean on internationalization of our education institutions in Mediterranean region is a report related to 10 Southern Mediterranean countries. I invite all of you to have a look because there are important information. I can ask Martina to, to share in the chat the link to download the report because you can find there some important information, not only about the current situation of internationalization of our education institutions in the Mediterranean region, but also some recommendations, some uh, potential solution to improve internationalization. 
there is a recommendation related to all the actors involved in internationalization ministries, but also education institutions, universities, uh, research center, and obviously also network like. Uh, the third element is that we are going to ask uh, to our political interlocutors to, to organize a Euro Mediterranean Ministerial Conference on Higher Education and Research. Uh, the last one was in 2007 in Cairo, and I think that is uh, after uh, what's happened in 2011 in some of Southern Mediterranean countries, the, 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 the two more in, in several of our partner countries, but also after this uh, period that is not ended, unfortunately. Uh, I think that a reflection on the future of our education is surely uh, necessary. Uh, and alliances among European universities and Southern Mediterranean University is surely not only mandatory, but must be reinforced. The European Commission is doing a lot, but more I think that is necessary to do. And we need for sure all your support at the institutional level to un endorse this uh, request. And hopefully in 2022, uh, we will be able to invite our uh, political interlocutors to, to organize such an event or at least to discuss. Uh, thank you very much again for your participation and uh, we will follow obviously through the, the work of Martina, the activity that you are doing in this sub-network and uh, let's keep in touch with the future, the future initiative. Please don't, come, don't forget that uh, the, the, Europe, the Horizon Europe program has been recently launched. And I think that in particular in your topic, this is an amazing opportunity to identify common priorities, common call for proposal on research through Horizon Europe program. As you know, it's a very competitive program. It's very difficult, but I think that the work that we are doing through the sub-network will help surely us to identify not only the good consortium, but also very good idea to be, to be a for finance. But I stop here because I, uh, I said a lot. And thank you very much again for your, for your work and for your cooperation. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you for those encouraging words and for mentioning also both the report and the Horizon Europe program, which is of great interest for the sub -mentor. Uh, I would uh, give the floor now to Professor Ficarella, which is the representative and the coordinator of this network from the University of Salento. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar. Al Salam, I'm Lekum. Um, I think that uh, uh, this will be a very important opportunity to strengthen the activities of the subnetwork. First of all, I would like to thank uh, to Director Scalisi, to the Jordan colleagues, Miss Danun, particularly Professor Al Rashaidat and uh, Dr. Jasin that will participate to this uh, uh, webinar, as well as uh, I would like to thank our colleagues from uh, Cyprus University, particularly Professor Eliades. And let me to uh, give, you know, a particular thank uh, to Martina Zipoli for all the management of the organization of the subnetwork, as well as my colleagues, uh, Professor Longo, as well as Professor Petty, that uh, uh, which contribution is uh, very, very important. But, and of course, thank to all the colleagues uh, that are participating to this webinar and uh, to uh, uh, the subnetwork. I would like to strengthen that it is important, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, using uh, uh, as a consequence of these webinars to depict a strategy for the future of the subnetwork. As the director said, we should look not tomorrow, but today uh, to the new uh, calls, uh, project calls that are coming from the European Union. 
Uh, you know very well that now uh, uh, for the uh, post-COVID recovery, uh, there are several uh, funds that are available for uh, international uh, uh, activities. And uh, as well as uh, I would like to say, it is ne necessary to strengthen the collaboration between the people that are in the subna network, even starting with the very simple activities. I don't know, sharing uh, degree thesis, sharing PhD thesis, starting PhD exchange, but also look, for example, to an international PhD program, starting the sharing of our lab facilities, uh, uh, in uh, you know uh, uh, you know that it is also possible uh, to share the lab facilities uh, uh, remotely uh, uh, if uh, if if uh, it, it could be you know a way to improve our collaboration uh, to start the society engagement related to, to our activities and let me to depict my dream uh, to, 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 to think to a kind of European Mediterranean university where we can share all the, our education contents and our research contents. Uh, this could be a very interesting goal of our subnetwork. Uh, sub this could be, you know, a dream for the high hope for the future. So I think that it, it is uh, enough, um, and uh, I would like to give the floor to the webinar and to the very interesting contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Figarella. Thank you for opening the floor to the webinar. I would uh, leave now the word to uh, Hadil Yassin from the greetings from the University of Jordan, and then we get to business. Hadil, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Martina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, I'm very pleased uh, to join Dr. Marcello, the director of UNIMED, and Dr. Antonio uh, from the University of Salento in welcoming you to the second webinar of the sub-network on safety and security of critical infrastructures. Uh, actually, I wish to thank UNIMED for the establishment of the sub-network that brings together research centers, university departments, faculties, academics, and researchers that work in the selected fields. In order to favor scientific cooperation, the exchange of experiences and information, the strengthening of existing partnerships, and the establishment of new collaboration in the Euro-Mediterranean region. I would like also to thank the University of Salento, the scientific co coordinator for the sub-network on safety and security for their dedication, uh, input and vision of the, uh, the sub-network in the short and long term. Uh, the University of Jordan strategic priorities states that uh, the importance of, uh, states the importance of national, regional and international strategic partnership uh, in which exchanging experiences and knowledge globally uh, comes as a strategic objective. Therefore, the University of Jordan is pleased to be selected as the subnetwork scientific coordinator. We are glad to provide resources and work together to help achieving the subnetwork goals and to develop effective partnerships. Uh, I would like to seize this opportunity and invite um, for a wide dissemination about this promising sub-network that includes the crucial aspects of our lives, uh, such as water, cybersecurity, food, health, energy, transportation, uh, yeah, etc. Uh, I would like also to encourage being part of the sub-network, actively engaging in its activities with commitment to networking and regular participation uh, to events. Uh, for today uh, webinars on cyber physical systems, security and resilience, we would like to wish for a great benefit and fruitful collaboration among our institutions in the field. Uh, thank you all 
and uh, we shall proceed now with the next session uh, at the University of Cyprus uh, and looking forward to the speeches of the experts in the field. Thank you all and uh, please Martina, the floor for you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Adil. Thank you so much and thanks everyone again for those Greetings. I think we can start with the very first session, and uh, which is moderated by uh, Demetrios Eliades from the from the University of Cyprus, the Kios, Kios Center. Is correct? Kios, right? Uh, yes. Did I say it right? Great. Yes. So um, I will give to you the duty to introduce the session and introduce our speaker, and of course I will be here follow up with you and the other colleagues. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Martina. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to see uh, all of you here, as well as my uh, you know, good colleagues from, uh, from the University of Cyprus, as well as uh, even all the way to Imperial College, UK. So we have a lot of people from uh, different continents. Uh, continents. The, the topic of today's of the internal sub section sub network session is on cyber physical security systems uh, and resilience, uh, focusing on, on all the aspects that relate uh, to having resilient critical infrastructures. Um, of course, here we mean um, power systems and uh, water systems and any other type of systems that you have in the context of smart cities. Um, we have five presentations today, uh, all very interesting, covering different aspects of this topic. Um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce the first speaker, is uh, Dr. Lenos Hajirimitriou from the, from the University of Cyprus, uh, working at, as a research lecturer at the Kios Research Innovation Center of Excellence, uh, who will present um, the work that uh, the team is doing there on Cyber security in, in relation to uh, um, uh, cyber physical security on relation power systems. We have each presentation will have ten minutes, and um, if, if there are any questions, I would like to kindly ask to add the, to put them in writing on the chat box. And uh, depending on the time, we will either do them after the presentation or in the end. So thanks, and Lennon, you have the floor. Uh, hi, Dimitri, and thank you very much for the introduction. I don't, can you see my screen? We can see your desktop. Yes, the desktop right now. Uh, okay. Yes, now we can see your presentation. Full screen, right? Yes. Okay, okay. So I would like to thank uh, the the Unimed sub-network for this opportunity to present some of the activities of the center uh, related to the cybersecurity aspect on the power and energy infrastructure. I would like also to thank Dimitris for the introduction and for coordinating this uh, effort as well. So in this uh, presentation today, we will discuss, uh, we will have a bit, uh, a short, uh, let's say, overview of the activities of the GEO Center of Excellence regarding the uh, cybersecurity uh, and considering the advanced infrastructure to enable some investigation uh, related to the cybersecurity in the smart grid framework, and of course, some intelligent intrusion detection schemes that we have already proposed. So, starting, I would like just to have a brief introduction about the, our center, where we are coming from. So the GEOS Research, Research and Innovation Center of Excellence is a part of the University of Cyprus. Uh, we're actually the largest research center in Cyprus with more than 160 researchers that are working and performing groundbreaking research uh, related to monitoring, control, and security of critical infrastructure. And in this framework, we're considering uh, energy system, water system, transportation system, and other critical infrastructure. I would like also to highlight that our research is completely funded by external resources, and mainly to due to Horizon 2020 project or ERC Advanced and Synergy grants, and of course a number of industry-funded projects in collaboration with the local international. 
industry uh, related to this critical infrastructure. Uh, uh, So uh, something is too slow in my computer. I apologize for that. So I would like just to, in this presentation, I would like just to give the overview of the Kios uh, Power and Security Group uh, activities. This group has been established in the last two years, actually, focusing on uh, on research to safeguard the smart grid operation against cyber attacks. So in this framework, we have also developed an, um, uh, some advanced laboratory and tested facility to enable uh, this investigation under realistic condition and to validate or demonstrate our research result in operational environment. And uh, I would like just to show some examples for this uh, infrastructure. So in this case, we have uh, we have developed a laboratory scale distribution grid where we can we have a, a number of loads uh, considering the, the consumers in a power grid we have a number of pv inverter considering the considering the production by the photovoltaic system and we have a number of smart meters in this case the smart meter are concentrated into the control center of the distribution system operator in an active distribution management system where we collect this measurement and according to the advanced metering infrastructure at the same point we have created some a number of automated control functions like a power factor compensation scheme or a containment scheme that coordinates the active component in this scheme like the, the inverters in order to regulate the overall operation of the grid and all these have been created based on, uh, on on some components in the lab considering this infrastructure now we are able to perform some cyber security attacks especially at the network level and uh, we can create some data set from actual attacks we perform risk and impact analysis in this framework and uh, we are able to propose new intrusion detection system in order to prevent uh, such uh, attacks. Some example of this, uh, what I'm mentioning, so here we have performed a number of attack, of cyber attack at the, uh, at the measurement site, so at the network level uh, to manipulate the measurement by the smart meter and this of course it is affecting also the operation of the system due to the automated uh, control function. So this is are some, uh, uh, we can see over here that uh, if we introduce an attack, we can cause either overloading condition in some case to the grid, or we can cause a reverse power flow condition, or we can minimize the, uh, minimize the production by the photovoltaic generation. All these kind of different attacks have been, we are able to concentrate all these data sets from the power operation, but also from the network traffic operation of this system. And this can be used, of course, for different investigation uh, or different analysis in this framework. We have also performed a risk and impact analysis on the specific system, showing that according to the operating condition of the distribution feeder, and also according to the installed capacity of the inverter in this feeder, we have different risk and different impact in order to cause a, a regional blackout in the distribution grid. And uh, furthermore, we have also developed a, uh, an advanced uh, intelligent intrusion detection system that uh, is based on, uh, it's, a, it's hybrid based, considering machine learning and signature based algorithm where we are able to we have apply network segmentation techniques and in combination with this uh, hyper intrusion detection system we are able not only to very accurately detect cyber attack but we can also classify uh, at which at which point exactly the attack has been performed so if the attack has been performed at the router level 
at the smart meter level or at the network and so on. And these algorithms are very robust against uh, the, the network traffic and so on. In another, let's say, direction, we consider also the cybersecurity aspect in digital substation. This is something very important in the future uh, power and energy system where we can see that the, the power substation and transform into the digital one. And this digital one are usually based on, on the integration of phasor measurement unit, which are advanced uh, measurement devices uh, that provide synchronized measurement with a very high reporting rate, but also with uh, it is also equipped with some protection relays, which is uh, which are intelligent electronic devices that can protect the system. In this framework, these devices are can are actually communicated either with the operator control center or with uh, a center where the protection engineer are operating. And uh, this communication is done either through the IEEC 37.118 protocol or through the IEC 6180 protocol. And having this interaction, so we have a real time simulator in our lab that we can see over here. Here we can have the digital twin of the power system where through a power amplifier we're interconnecting these devices over here. And we have an emulation of this control center in our laboratory where we can perform such, such attacks at the network level and see the impact into the system or to perform the attack in order to consider the, some data sets, some data that can be used by researchers perform further research or to perform again this risk and impact analysis or protect the system again, uh, through some intelligent algorithms. Uh, again, some attacks we can see over here that we have developed some actual attacks on the C37 uh, protocol for the second phase door application with the PMUs where we, can, we are able to change either the voltage or the current measurement and this, of course, can affect uh, can affect very much the the operation of the application and that are related to this uh, measurement. Again, an, uh, a data set considering both the power and the network operation have been concentrated in this case. And additionally, we have created a, a novel intrusion detection system in order to try to prevent this kind of attack. This system is based on a behavioral model that consider a set of analytical redundancy relations for the, based on the power system analysis, let's say, that, and by using this analytical redundancy relation in order uh, not only to detect the system, but also to detect an attack, but also through a rule-based algorithm we are able to isolate and be able to define that the attack has been performing in the specific, in the voltage of the specific phase and so on. Uh, and uh, an, in another direction, we are also considering an, an intrusion detection system for, for the protection relays case study, where uh, we consider an attack on the GUS framework, on the GUS protocol of the IEC 6250. And in this case, uh, we're trying to analyze the specification of this protocol, uh, extract and extract some specific uh, network feature from the traffic of this communication, and we have uh, introduced some uh, some detection rule that can provide us with very very accurate detection uh, and detection of this attack in this framework. Uh, you know, can you so please? Ah, yes. Thank you. Can you please summarize? So, uh, closing, I would like just to highlight that uh, we can collaborate with any member of the, of the UNIMED network. Uh, we can, in, in this framework, we can uh, share some uh, data, set, uh, data sets from specific cyber attack scenarios. Uh, we, can, uh, we can test some algorithm that someone else has done in our uh, framework in order to validate the research result or we can jointly investigate some impact of these attacks using the hardware in the loop scenario in our labs. 
Uh, we are very, very open to exchange of student and researcher in order to establish strong collaboration links with other university and partners. And of course, we, are, we would be very glad to collaborate on research tasks to publish some high quality in general conference. And of course, the participation in joint research project, either through the horizon or other frameworks uh, related to the security and power is something that we can, uh, we can work on. And uh, I would like just to, hire, to thank my, my team in the Geo Center of Excellence that is working in this aspect. And of course, a uh, short acknowledgement to the, to the sponsors of this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you Leno. And um, we are um, running a bit late, so I don't see any questions at the moment. So let's, let's proceed to the uh, next one. And uh, maybe we'll have some time in the end where we, are, we will be able to answer these questions. Uh, let's proceed with Professor Edin Sambrin Kair from the University of Georgia, uh, where he will present uh, the work on hierarchical architecture for mobile object identification in the context of uh, IoT smart cities. Uh, professor? Uh, yeah, good, good morning. Are... Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Uh, if you can uh, put it in full screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. So good morning, everybody. And thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, my name is Khairi Dean Sabri. I am from the University of Jordan at the Computer Science Department. Uh, actually, my research interest is doing some formal verification of system to verify some of the security properties. Usually we use some formal mathematical models such as algebra, logical based system to specify some properties, either in access control systems or even for developing and verifying protocols. And this is one of our research with my colleagues and one of our PhD students it is about developing a protocols, architecture and protocols for authentication within the context of IoT smart cities. Uh, I will give just an overview of our research with the necessary background for doing that. First of all, what is the Internet of Things? Internet of Things actually just describe a network of physical objects. These objects, they are connected together, they are collecting information and sharing data. Uh, example of such devices, it could be smartphones, it could be laptop, uh, it could be security cameras, medical sensors, etc. Based on these devices, usually we can build some smart systems. For example, we can have smart parking, traffic management, uh, something for controlling the air pollution and other systems. And based on this system, we can build the smart cities. Why we need smart cities? To improve the quality of life, uh, to reduce the cost, to improve the efficiency. However, this, this, these systems, similar to other systems, usually we have many security concerns. One of these concerns is the authentication. For each device to be connected, to a system and to use the service or to share data, we need to, to prove the identity of this device or this user. This is what we call the authentication. There are different kinds of authentication. One of them is by using what we call digital signature. So what is digital signature? It is come from what we call the public key cryptography. It is a way of encryption. Usually there are two different ways of encryption. One of them, what we call symmetric key en encryption. The other one, which is asymmetric or public key encryption. In public key encryption, usually there are two keys. One of them, the private key. So each user or each device has two keys. One of them is private, the other one is public. So the one, uh, the one that needs to design or to, to give the signature use its private key. And the public key, it is distributed to all other uh, server or users, which can be used to verify the signature, giving the one who signed it using the private key. 
However, there are some issues in this and using public key, which is how to link the public key with the user. There are different kinds. One of them is using what we call digital certificate. Another way to, to, to relate the public key with the user is to use what we call identity-based signature. In identity-based signature, usually the identity of the user is used as the public key. So in this case, the, the identity is well known to all the others and can be used to use can be used as a public key and be used to verify the signature of the user. However, usually we have what we call a public key generator. This generator it is a trusted party that can be used to generate the keys uh, to do the risk to, to do the setup and registration for the object and the servers, the one that give the signature and the other one that is verify the signatures. Uh, there are different way or different algorithms that is based on public key, crypt, uh, public key encryption. One of them is elliptic curve cryptography. It is an algebraic structure uh, of elliptic curve over finite fields. Uh, one of the advantage of using elliptic curve over other public key encryption such as RSA, it usually use a smaller key size. So in this with the same security level. So in this case, we can have, it is more efficient than other algorithms. So this is just an overview of background, what we need to do an authentication and in general. So what are the challenges that we have in IO devices? There are different kinds of challenges. One of them is the scalability. Uh, we should be able, or the system should be able to deal with a huge number of IO devices and to scale up to support these numbers. Uh, there are other issues such as the heterogeneity. They're usually these devices come from different domains, use different networks. Also, we have the mobility. Usually the device, for example, the smartphone is not located in one place. It is moving between different places and using different networks. So the user should be able to authenticate to the system regardless of the network that's using. And the last one is the limited capabilities of the IoT devices in terms of storage and processing. So to solve one of these issues, for example, the scalability, we generate uh, an, a hierarchy of machines. For example, we have the root, the public key generator, the root, and then we have the sub public key generators. This is actually just an overview. There are many details there, regardless what the information should be stored in the public key generator, what are the information stored in each one of these sub servers, uh, how the communication between these machines is accomplished, what, uh, how the registration is is the, for example, is performed, etc. So there are many details there. I will not go into details. So in this way, we can uh, reduce the overhead on the server by distributing the load on different machines. However, here we are assuming that both of them, they are belonging to the same network and using the same public key generator, but we can go to more general architecture by assuming, okay, we have the machine or the user could belong or subscribed with one system while we have another system with where this information, it is with another cloud or another servers. And here's again, we need a way for communications. So we develop different protocols that allow us to implement this architecture by specifying how the keys are implemented or produced how the communication and the message they are sent to between all these different systems. After we developed a protocol, now this is the second step, how to make sure that our protocol is secure and, get, and give us the goal that we are aiming to. Here's what we do is the protocol verification or system verification. It is the second step after developing the protocol. So in the verification, usually in general, we need to specify the system or the model, give a model to the system. Here's in our case, it is a mathematical model. 
usual, it could be an algebraic model or a logic-based system or start or uh, final state machine. In our case, we have a logical system that describes the system. We give the system properties, which is actually it is a security properties regarding of authentication. And then we do the verification. So either the system, we can prove that formally that the system is secure regarding the model and the property that we have, or we cannot prove. And if we cannot prove, this means that there is an issue of, in our protocol. So we did formal verification based on one of the model logic is called pan logic to verify the security properties of our protocols. Based on the formal verification and based on the properties of the elliptic curve that we use, we were able to prove different uh, propositions regarding our architecture, security properties. For example, the intruder or the adversary cannot compute the private key from the public information, or if the adversary has two different signatures, also he or she cannot compute what is the private key. Uh, no one can, or it is the protocol is safe re regarding the replay attack and other kind of attacks such as impersonating attack. After we proving the system is secure, of course, we need to show up that, okay, we improve the efficiency of our system. Uh, one of the way of doing the performance evaluation is that theoretically by computing and evaluating what could be the cost of doing the verification of the phases that we have in terms of verification, registration, and generating the signature, and comparing that with other with other protocols. So this is this is one of our research is doing developing protocols, and based on these protocols, of course, that we have different aims of these protocols, and after de developing the protocols we do formal verification of these protocols to make sure that they are secure. We also use uh, in, other, in other direction, we have also used the formal methods of uh, building some access control models, which is also a very important aspect of security. So we have, we develop mathematical model. This is also based on logic-based model to develop, to, to build the model, and then to verify some properties regarding that model. And thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Professor um, Sambri. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, as a reminder, again, I see that there, there are some people writing questions to the chat, so please uh, continue doing that, and uh, we'll try to uh, address this either through the chat or in the end um, of the session. So uh, thanks again. Yeah. Uh, we will proceed with the presentation from Professor Antonio Scarmeta from Universidad de Murcia, Murcia in Spain, sorry, Murcia, I suppose it's called, Spain. Um, the presentation is gonna be on, uh, on um, on, on dynamic security deployment based on software defined networking and network uh, and, and network function visualizations on scenarios such as smart buildings and network infrastructures. So, um, Professor Carmeta, if you can just switch the presentation mode. Um, yes, we can now see the full screen and uh, you can start. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, thanks for, for the invitation to be part of this workshop. Um, 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 as I already mentioned, it is a pleasure to, to collaborate also with other members here of the Mediterranean area. Um, in, in, in my case, as I already mentioned, uh, we wanted to, I mean, instead of going to a very concrete, I was at the description of some of the, of the, uh, uh, um, the results that we are already having, it's, it's more about um, to indicate some kind of uh, challenges that we are now trying to face over different projects. Here you can see a couple of uh, European projects where we are involved. It's co uh, concretely CyberSec for Europe, where it's one of the pilots for the cyber se uh, se security research centers. 
and also in, in Spy 5G, where basically we are uh, working on, on security on 5G networks in that sense. So basically, I will try to to connect basically what we are doing there with the with the objective of the of the um, management of the security in this case of the of the of the IoT mostly on on that kind of the scenarios. So basically, um, I, I already was mentioned, but I think I wanted just to to highlight a, a, again that one of the main problems we, when we are talking about uh, of IoT or CPS in general, I would say cyber physical system, it is that we are facing a quite uh, new branch of, um, of uh, security issues no, that are coming here. No? Up to now, when we were talking about uh, systems, uh, we, are, we were talking about the collection of more uh, homogeneous collection of uh, operating systems, uh, where uh, 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 every time a new vulnerability was detected, uh, easily uh, new patches appear and so on and so on. But now when we are talking about IoT or CPS, we are talking about a very heterogeneous and diversity of the devices that can be part of this scenario. And that is creating a quite a new uh, challenge of, uh, of uh, vector of attacks and, and, and also new threats that are in some case due for the lack of, uh, I would say, the capability to, to, to update either the firmware of these uh, devices because either the, the company already disappear in some of the cases. In other case, because they are very constrained device and, 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 and very uh, easy uh, attacks, for example, for buffer overflow can happen in many cases. So there's a lot of different scenarios. And also because, because of this heterogeneity and the number of device, the possibility to, uh, to, to launch a new kind of attacks is, is quite, uh, um, uh, I would say, um, easy and novel, I would say, on, on, on that kind of scenario. And, and, and the main problem is that when we're talking about the IoT or CPS, we're talking about everywhere, I would say, in, the, in our actual life. Every, because of the digitalization now, we are having um, this possibility of having everything connected. Uh, so we are talking about elevators, we are talking about in the buildings, about sensors about uh, 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 about fire alarms, uh, or, or if we are talking about cameras, as you know, uh, I mean, one of the typical attack, no, about someone is, is accessing to the device to the camera and based from there is able to launch a denial of service over the whole internet. So basically, there's a lot of different scenarios. So that's uh, uh, what we need is, is a way to be able to uh, to create some kind of dynamicity on the possibility of of reconfigure the security on on on, on the different contexts, specific on, on critical infrastructure. I would say in some sense, no. Um, we need to be able to 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 be able to adapt and to uh, uh, to create in front of a new kind of attacks or a, or a, a attack that was not initially be, uh, be uh, 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 managed uh, to be able to launch mitigation actions so that we can try to, uh, to create, in some case, an update of the software of the device, in other case, just to create a, a, um, um, a, a security area so where, where we can block several or some of the connections. So we need to be able to, 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 do, that, to do this in a very real time um, uh, action, I would say, in some sense. And for that, one of the advantages that we are having is, is part is, uh, it is not because of 5G, but it's because of the technology that is be, be, uh, behind 5G, specifically the virtualization and the capability of intelligent management of all the resources uh, is, uh, is allowing us the possibility to really uh, uh, provide this kind of uh, new solution that uh, allow us to dynamically uh, 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 manage the security of, on this kind of environment in that sense. And this kind of environment I already mentioned can be on anything. And for example, could be in vehicle scenario. For example, we are in another project that is 5G Mobix, where basically we are, we are just touching security and privacy management of the of that exchange, for example, on that kind of a, a scenario of the vehicular communication, for example. So I think that it is quite broad, I would say, the kind of scenario. So basically when we are talking uh, dynamicity management in general, what we are talking, we're talking the issue of being able to, for example, to react to uh, zero day vulnerability, for example, or new kind of attack. Uh, such, uh, for example, as, as slow den uh, denial of service, uh, for example, that is quite emerging on the scenario of, of the IoT, I would say in some sense. To be able to, uh, to deploy dynamically in real time and as a consequence of a possible new threat, uh, new components in the network that could uh, support certain of the security function. Or for example, that could be able to reconfigure or to change the security configuration of the communications that are happening between the different device in our uh, critical infrastructure in some sense. So for that, as I already mentioned, the combination of flexibility that offer SDN, NFB, in order to, to, to recreate this component on the network in a very easy way. And the orchestration, I would say, of the, of the capability of the orchestration of solution like Mano and, and, and others, uh, really in combination with the, with the new um, uh, kind of technologies that are available, really are providing this kind of support uh, for this uh, kind of uh, situation. 
So in that context, what we have been working on, and this is part of the, the continuous work that we have over several projects, basically what we have been working is, is how to create a closed loop on all these process that I already mentioned, that go from the definition of uh, what for, for us is a central piece, that is a security orchestrator, basically, that is, a, the, is the orchestration in the concept of, uh, of, uh, of managing uh, how to communicate and coordinate uh, different components over the infrastructure, uh, but guided by a security policy. So that the, the security policy or a combination of security policy define in any moment what can be done over the infrastructure in order to try to react or provide certain kind of security properties, security functionality or, or security services, I would say in some sense. No? And here the main point is that, I mean, uh, uh, apart from, I'm not going to talk about that part, but basically but apart from the description of the policy and how this policy can be consistently managed, then we need to have a way to uh, define what is this orchestration of the policy and the policy then need to be instantiated, can be deployed out over uh, the infrastructure using in this case uh, access to the standard like could be a, a nfb mano for the management of the of the nfb part to the connection to the sdn controller so that the s controller can connect uh, to the infrastructures and to the switch in order to manage for example virtual firewalls or, or virtual honeypots or something like that and either to the iot controller so we need to create a a, a layer similar to what the SDN controller and the NFB controller uh, is happening in relation to the IoT, to this heterogeneous scenario, so that you have a common northbound API in order to provide the records of the security, and then you have a southbound that is being instantiated to the different kind of, uh, of different uh, IoT devices that you can have in a certain, in a certain environment. So here there's uh, several challenges that uh, in our case, some of them we are already covered. Other one, we understand that are uh, things that need to be still research on uh, that go from the policy management, as I already mentioned, to how to, uh, uh, provide, how to investigate and identify this kind of new cyber threats, for example, and be able to this kind of zero days attack that can happen uh, based on the, on the continuous change uh, on the continuous new uh, um, uh, identification of vulnerability. Uh, as I mentioned, how to create this security orchestration, how to do it in a trust environment in that sense, how to do the, the, the orchestration of the different resources, et cetera, et cetera. So basically there are several points that at the end are part of this uh, research area that we consider quite, quite uh, interesting now. So just to show you one example of this uh, kind of distribution is here is, is one of the examples we already have been working on, a scenario in the building, in, in concrete was in scenario of the smart building, uh, with the idea that uh, the idea to combine and create this closed loop. No, and mostly you can see from the number that in certain moment there is an attack that is going to to a, an IoT infrastructure. Here could be, a, I mean, in industry, a robots area or something like that. Uh, uh, where basically, if if you already have some kind of deploy, uh, for example, IDS in the infrastructure, you already are able to detect that something is happening. There's a, some some problems that you can see here in the in the in the step number two. Because of this, uh, there's a mitigation service, so you already know that there is a possible attack. So you need to have a mitigation. Mitigation is a is a is a, is a policy that you need to be paid, uh, put in place in order to react to that possible attack in that sense. And that in policy will imply, as you can see here, interaction with the SDN, for example, to try to make a redirection of the traffic, uh, for example, uh, and all the traffic could be sent to a honey net. For example, you need to have uh, interaction with the NFB that allow you to deploy new components in the infrastructure, for example, a firewall, uh, I mean, a, a new IDS or, ex or extended version of the IDS or change the policies of the IDS. And then you can have also some uh, interaction with the, with the controllers, with the IoT controller, so that you can, for example, in this case, uh, um, switch on or, 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 or as we are deriving the traffic, uh, just create an, an area uh, to, 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 to isolate, for example, the, the, the possible uh, the, uh, device under attack, for example. I mean, this kind of interaction that I already mentioned. Uh, exact, this, is, this example concretely, we have already applied it to the, to the scenario of the smart building, where basically we, we, we configure a collection of attacks in that sense, where basically it was from, from uh, attacking different sensors of temperature that uh, maybe affect, for example, the, the launch of a fire alarm that was a, 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 diver a diversion so that people can then, the, the, the attacker can go to another part of the, of the infrastructure to attack, etc. And the idea was to, to recreate, and here basically we, we, we provide solution for doing the deployment of authentication of the devices, to create new configuration of the security policies on the devices, to change the, for example, the, 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 the length of the key of the certain devices uh, in runtime so that uh, if something we understand need to be increase the security 
um, and uh, to deploy, as I already mentioned, a firewall, deploying a honey net, uh, uh, all in, in all the kind of scenarios. So to be able to, as you mentioned, as I mentioned, react very quickly on the on the on that structure. No, so basically this is the complete architecture that basically we already have. I mean, I'm not going just to go in detail, but basically for you to understand that uh, there there are several elements that are participating on the infrastructure in order to, in, in the um, in the security management, I would say of the infrastructure. So to to give support to go from, from if this attack is detected, as I already mentioned, a reaction is being produced uh, once it has been monitored and, 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 and analyzed. Because of this, we, we create a remediation that is a policy. The policy imply a new deployment. And because of the deployment, there are some, uh, some either some kind of notification and, uh, and audit of the issue through, through, uh, through a, a kind of a, um, a seal manager that uh, maintain all the data. Yeah, I'm, I'm just finalizing. Yes. Okay, and this is quite a, a, a similar example regarding I mean, a, a, some, the same stuff regarding an infrastructure about 5G. So for example, what happened if we want to isolate certain IoT nodes in a, a, in a slice in that sense? Uh, because we we are under suspicion that there is a kind of attack in that sense. So basically, in that case, what we we create was exactly something similar. We uh, create a new slice in, uh, for the IoT that is under attack, and we interact with all the 5G infrastructure. And here you can see all the elements and, and also the 5G core network, uh, so that we uh, uh, launch the new slice, move the device to the new slice, and and recreate, uh, isolate that slide in order to analyze what is happening on the on that scenario. So basically, just to conclude, uh, because my time is gone, uh, is basically what I already mentioned, is that uh, um, all this kind of um, uh, advantage, uh, basically, that the, the dynamicity of the network management uh, are providing new tools, and these tools allowed us to really be able to uh, dynamically uh, recreate and provide um, um, new security, I would say, um, mitigation action, for example, uh, that can be dynamically configured, and where, in our case, uh, our, our tools that help us on, in order to manage these new kind of uh, cyber attacks that are happening on the, on the area of IoT. And that's all for my side. Thanks again, uh, Demetrius, and so sorry for taking a little bit more time. No, it's, it's okay. Thanks, uh, thanks Professor. Um, again, uh, just a reminder, uh, I see that some people are writing uh, their questions. I'm, I'm, I'm writing them down, so in the end, we're gonna have a few minutes to, to respond to them. Uh, in case uh, one of the participants wants to respond in the chat, they can do this as well uh, to uh, save some time. Now, uh, let's proceed with uh, Professor Antonella Longo at the University of Salento in Italy, um, where she will discuss, she present the issue of security and resilience features on energy systems, digital twins. Um, Antonella, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, first of all, just a very quick uh, presentation introduction to our center. Uh, we are uh, developing an interdisciplinary research center res related to security re and resilience of critical infrastructure. So the main vision we want to, uh, to provide from our side is an interdisciplinary approach, uh, mostly uh, based on uh, the engineering aspect, all the different uh, facet of engineering aspect, but um, our main goal is to uh, uh, see the interrelationship between Low and uh, engineering, business management, and engineering aspect related to critical infrastructure. And um, this is the reason why we started uh, working and uh, um, try to give our um, our perspective about uh, the topic of digital twins. Um, uh, digital twin uh, is uh, def defined as a, the virtual representation of uh, real world entities and process which is synchronized at a specific, specified frequency and fidelity. Um, it means that when we have this digital twin of the, our physical system, actually we are enabled for accelerating the holistic understanding. We have an optic, optical, optimal tool for decision making and a more effective action. Mostly, and this is uh, what we are trying to stress. Uh, digital twins is based on uh, data, evidence. 
So real-time data, historical data, and they are used for representing the past, the present, and simulate for predicting the future. Uh, the other main aspect is that any digital twins is uh, based on user use cases. So mainly when we talk about digital twins, we are talking about the, um, the uh, representation, the model of a small uh, system or a very limited system. This is the reason why what we are working on at the moment is on the definition of the digital, uh, digital twin representation, which would be um, uh, quite larger because when we talk about the digital twin of an energy system, which provides energy services or delivers energy services, we have several different aspects to be um, considered. So we have some uh, structural aspect which can be represented by uh, physical, um, the physical, uh, the physical uh, element like uh, the beam, the GIS, uh, some IoT streams, but we have also a lot of uh, computational representation which must be taken into account and, we, and which must be based on reference data. Um, we are starting uh, from uh, um, de uh, defining the bull architecture based on uh, the, the idea uh, provided by the Digital uh, Twins Consortium, which is uh, a, a specific project from uh, OMG um, organization. Uh, it is a, 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 a private, pri private public organization, so we think that it would be a good starting point. Um, uh, so our activities currently is going into the virtual representation of the store representation, the computational ones, and uh, in the definition also of all the kind of data um, related to this. We think that this part is particularly important and this is the reason why we are structuring the, the, the idea of the data lake of energy um, systems. Because starting from that, we will be able to, um, to have the model for uh, create a good synchronization method between the real world and the, uh, and the virtual world. We will provide services interfaces for good applications for both monitoring, management, and uh, uh, all the application. Then we have the good connection with uh, the uh, IT and OT infrastructure. All this is based on the fact that we must um, have uh, good features related to security, trust, and governance. Now, here the concept is quite large because uh, uh, when we talk about security, we have uh, physical security, uh, information security, we have problem related to um, data protection, and then we go into res resilience. So we are um, modeling, we are uh, instantiating this model for energy systems in the, in the specific. Actually, we have, uh, um, we have uh, gone into some uh, systematic literature review to understand what is going on in digital twins of energy systems. And it, it is quite uh, some, some funny stuff because uh, we saw that uh, um, uh, the main, the, from the three main digital libraries, uh, there are only 37 papers about digital twins of energy systems starting from 2018. But uh, as you see in this picture, um, the number is increasingly really, really high. So it is a, a hot topic um, which we want to uh, go in, uh, stay into. Currently, the main key, keyword, uh, um, uh, key, keyword used are several physical systems, data analytics, Internet of Things. And uh, uh, we found quite a few papers, actually three papers, related to cybersecurity. 
So digital twins currently, uh, digital twins for energy systems are currently mainly used for energy management, proactive maintenance, and smart grid and microgrids. And the paper we found are mainly on these specific aspects uh, related to smart grids and microgrids. So we think that uh, um, uh, there, is, there are a lot of space or a lot of uh, um, uh, floor for um, investigating uh, all the cyber physical uh, um, security and resilience aspect, uh, starting from the definition of a common digital, um, uh, digital twins model. Um, uh, strictly related to cyber security and resilience aspects. And um, when we talk about uh, uh, digital twins of energy systems, uh, since they ground on the use of a remote mode of working, uh, but which is based on data, uh, uh, on data, um, risks are very related to cyber attacks but also to the full supply chain uh, activities to the presence of mistakes made by people in the chain or me people in the system in the in the power energy uh, systems from the, uh, the, the, the safety um, issues related to mismaintenance so um, there are um, very uh, a lot of different aspects to be considered when we model these digital twins um, uh, environment this is the reason why we are going for a dependent a dependable multi-perspective model. What, do, what do, I, uh, do I mean? I mean that uh, since uh, when we talk about uh, digital uh, the, um, to energy systems, actually we are talking about uh, an ecosystem of, uh, um, of actors uh, who um, provide and use energy systems. Digital twins can enable the dynamic use of energy uh, to make it uh, to make this, the wood system more uh, um, efficient and effective. But for doing this, uh, there are some dependencies among the different actors. This, uh, and for, this is the reason why we are modeling the wool, uh, the wool system as a dependable model. Then th there is the other aspect of multi-perspective because we have several different stakeholders. We have uh, um, cyber aspect, physical aspect, and uh, we can't... Uh, um, and neglect the uh, regulatory compliance aspect and the personal physical aspect. So, um, uh, uh, current, uh, current works. Uh, together with uh, the modeling of the digital twins uh, uh, systems of energy, uh, energy systems, we are also defining the concept of energy services. Who provides in which way energy services are provided? The concept of service is different from the concept of a product. So we have to, play, to uh, sharply define what, what it is in order to model it in the proper way. Then we are working on the data-driven resilience model of energy uh, systems based on this digital twins approach, but considering the presence of the social aspect in order to handle uh, dynamically the demand and provision of energy. The last but not the least, um, uh, we are uh, developing the data lake of energy sector, at least at national level. For doing that, uh, we have started collecting data uh, from uh, open data, incident data from uh, uh, power system, metering data. And now we are working on uh, uh, structuring the wool, um, uh, the wool model and to provide the proper service, uh, fair services, fair in the sense of uh, uh, fair data services, in the sense of findable, interoperable, accessible, and the reusable data services, which are uh, fundamental for use this data in the digital twins model. Uh, just a very few uh, I, uh, screenshots, uh, pictures about who we are currently are, but this is just a, a small group. There are other people who joined the whole, the whole group recently. 
for any question, consider me available. We are more than open to work with uh, um, all of you, especially when we talk about how to um, uh, start from data in uh, analyzing and work on uh, uh, security aspects. So data protection model, uh, um, dynamic uh, data protection model. So not only the, the, the problem related to cyber attacks, but also how to protect data when they flow from one, one layer to the other in the digital twins model. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonella. Um, and uh, now we will go to the last presentation by Professor Amtel Kaler Lawit from the University of El Elouet in Algeria. Um, it's about AI solutions to study the impact of intruders in unsecured systems. Professor Lawit. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Can you share the screen? Okay. And just to to make the preference to share with Zoom with my laptop. Mm -hmm. I should restart uh, Zoom to in order to make the sharing screen. Just a few minutes. I think we have a technical problem then. I see Professor Lawid just entered back to Zoom, so it should be working now. Okay, hello again. Now I have the right to share the screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Can you please put it on in full screen? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Abdul Qadr Lawid. I'm from University of Alouad. I'm working in the uh, cyber physical attacks. I have uh, some research in this uh, content. I'm so happy to know you in this domain is very important domain. So my presentation is about uh, some researches and uh, projects that I do with my colleague here. And I'm so happy to work with you in the future in the next uh, uh, researches. So my uh, presentation is about the impact of the introducer on the unsecured systems. So uh, there are uh, many issues, new issues here in the IoT and low end devices. So with the low uh, computation, with the low uh, memory storage of the uh, small devices, we, we, uh, uh, we find many uh, issues of how to prevent 
attacks in these devices. So we have some artificial intelligence solutions that we are working on in order to efficiently exploiting these uh, devices. So the main issues is with huge data and with the existence of the complica uh, complicated systems and the weakness of formal methods. So today, as you know, that we have uh, huge data, which are mostly generated from uh, low-end devices, from sensors, from cameras, from uh, smartphones and others. So these data uh, uh, can be uh, credential data, private data. How to secure these data? How to make uh, secure communications between uh, these devices with the, the system or the cloud with new uh, solutions. So here as solutions, what we need, what we need to export the artificial intelligence, the data analytics and the cyber secure systems in order to integrate these devices with with uh, with our systems. So this is uh, here. I will present some activities what we are uh, develop in our laboratory. Well, uh, we have defined a Swedia project, which is uh, made with um, uh, uh, collaboration with. Uh, University of uh, Bretagne Occidental in France and Manchester uh, Metropolitan University also in uh, UK. We have defined uh, a new uh, prototype of how to doctors and patients communicate using IoT devices, smartphones, uh, sensors, and many uh, things that are connected with the internet, we define new, uh, new prototypes that use uh, the technology of the homomorphic encryption. What does mean the homomorphic encryption? How to manipulate the encrypted data without the, uh, knowing what the data uh, means or what the, uh, the information is of the data. Also, we have de defined uh, smart contracts in the systems that offer, as uh, we have seen uh, right now, uh, smart contracts is the certificate to, uh, to trust these uh, devices in our systems. So here we define the the patient's devices. And we have used the for computing for pre-treatments of the data. Also here, the doctor can use the uh, IoT devices to manipulate the data. Here, we present the data, how is the data is stored in the cloud and how to uh, access it to this data. This is, is uh, the project uh, <laughs> defined for uh, as solution for in the medical health care. Yes. In the collaborations, I would like to invite you uh, to make uh, some collaborations mainly in the Mediterranean regions because uh, here uh, Elwood University is in the desert. We can exploit the 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 energy, the green energy, how to introduce the artificial intelligence for the green energy. Also, we can uh, treat the agriculture, which uh, because the region of uh, El Wad here is the first region in the Algeria that provide the agriculture in sections. Also, we, we, uh, we have some projects for water management because here the, we have 
uh, huge aquifer, uh, aquifer of uh, water, but we have many uh, some issues like the salinity of uh, of the uh, the salinity of the water. Uh, we have the issues of the nature of the land and others. So we uh, we can use uh, these systems to uh, to define or uh, proposing uh, projects uh, in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Professor Lawit. Uh, and, um, and this concludes uh, the presentations. Um, so if I could, uh, if I could just, um, um, I would like to thank again all the speakers uh, that presented uh, today. And we have a number of questions, but uh, let me just say a few words. Uh, uh, essentially, I think we saw uh, our presenters presented a, a variety of topics that are related to the topic of cyber and physical security. We saw how to simulate and emulate cyber physical attacks on power systems, as well as how to achieve trust when millions of, uh, of mobile devices are connected in a, virtual, in, in a, in a, in a real uh, smart city. Uh, we saw how to cope with new cyber physical attacks using policy-based um, security orchestration and mitigation uh, and some really nice ideas there with rerouting to honeypots or creating new functions we saw uh, how to use the digital twins um, for uh, energy for energy systems for decision making also this nice initiative about integrating data from multiple sources for a national repository as well as how to share data in a secure privacy preserving way so i think uh, we covered a lot of things we had some questions that I think were as answered. Um, you can find them in the chat. Uh, for instance, for um, uh, Lenos, uh, there, there was a question about uh, how to treat man in the middle attacks in IoT uh, low end device uh, environments, as well as how to model power stations, substations, in digital twins. I believe, uh, Leno, this has been answered in the chat, unless you want to make any further. Comments on that? Uh, hi, uh, actually, I thought the, the sec I, I asked about the digital twin of the, of the, of the digital substation, uh, but uh, I don't know if it's the, the man in the middle attack at the IoT low end device. It was for me or for the next? Yeah, yeah, it was for you. It was for you. Ah, okay. I can answer it in, in the chat, but uh, uh, I, 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 or we can. Actually, we are performing the attacks at the as man in the middle. We have the, find different, let's say, uh, different strategy for this attack, uh, either by art poisoning or other techniques. Uh, at this, uh, uh, considering that we have access at the private area network of the of the smart grid. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Exactly. So, if if there are any further requ um, you know requests. Uh, feel free to conduct uh, Lenos. Uh, for Professor uh, Sambri, there was a question uh, whether it's possible to provide a distributed solution. And I see that uh, we also answered, uh, you also answered this uh, question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to make any further additions to this comment. Uh, no, actually, distributed I, nature. Yeah, as I wrote, usually we have two different layers of communications and protocols. So one of them with the edge and other one between the edge and the cloud. So there's mm -hmm. nothing more to add. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Professor Scarmetta, there was a question about how you manage the data protection on the edge uh, layer. Um, I don't uh, know if you... No, Professor Scarmetta had to leave for another meeting. So it's not... Ah, oh, oh, Unfortunately, okay. it's not with us. Um, but uh, we can eventually direct the question uh, via email and <clears throat> get him to provide some additional input um, if needed. Perfect. And I had a, I had a question also for Antonella, uh, whether you actually, uh, for the digital twin, whether we, uh, how you see the, um, the involvement of, of realistic simulators. For the, I mean, for the digital twins, we are talking about having 
systems that model accurately the physics of the systems or do you think it's going to be in a more abstract way so do you, you know, what, what is the, from the pure mathematical to the pure let's say computational let's say what do you think is the balance for these digital twins uh well actually um the main uh, the main issue we are currently challenged uh, is the fact that we use uh, tools like uh, simlink uh, which are uh, you know close environment so um, for maybe the first effort we should uh, um, uh, do all together is to think about a platform where we have uh, more um, open and interoperable tools in order to put together the computational aspect with the data management aspect, the asset aspect. Because uh, actually most of the simulation, the digital twins are based on Simulink, which is still a very closed um, uh, package application. So uh, I don't know if Dimitrius, I'm, uh, I'm, I answered to uh, your question, but I think that uh, we need to, to do a step forward and work on a shared platform for interoperable services among the different assets. Mm -hmm. Yes, this sounds like, uh, this is very interesting and sounds step towards that direction. Um, I don't know if there are any other comments uh, or if there are any raised hands. Um, if not, I would like to thank again all the speakers and, uh, and, uh, and the people who ask questions. And I, I, can, I can now give the floor back to Martina. Yes, thank you, thank you. And thanks for your moderation of the session and thanks for your time. And um, now we, as long as the uh, agenda of the webinar is concerned, we have a little break, but we are also somehow late on, on the schedule. So uh, I'm not sure whether you want to just move forward or um, you would like to um, have a, a coffee and then get back to, to, to work. Um, we can eventually, if you agree, take just five minutes just to drink a coffee and, uh, you know, um, have a quicker break. And then we can start 11.35 or 11.40, let's say, back with the round table. It will be uh, Professor Antonella Longo to chair the, the session. So um, let's say we all stay connected and meet back in uh, eight minutes, 11.40 for the round table. So thanks for your time so far and we'll get back um, in a few minutes.
so uh, we we can come back, uh, Martina. Maybe a few minutes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> We're back on track. <laughs> Not sure whether everyone is coming back already. I see some faces showing up. I see Antonella is ready on the table. <laughs> and also some other colleagues uh, and the idea now for the second session is exactly to have a round table with some stakeholders which were invited to the webinar so that to share um, some inputs from others uh, other perspective um, outside our sub network members and, and try to uh, explore the possibilities of connecting what our researchers are doing with what others are doing uh, and see what's, what can come up with that. So more experience will be shared, more insights will be given to our researchers. And I think we do not need to delay further this round table and I will give to Antonella the floor to moderate the session. Thank you, Antonella. Thanks a lot, Martina. So thanks, uh, thanks. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone to this second part, uh, the second part of this, uh, of this uh, webinar. And uh, this is devoted to a roundtable with uh, public and private stakeholders. So I'm very honored to chair this session where, with the very well reputed panelists and friends. Um, uh, I can see here Vlad Vasiski, who is the program manager of the cybersecurity program of, uh, at CRDF Global in Ukraine. Yeah, so then, right. then we have my friend Saba Krasnasny. Uh, from the National University of Public Service in Hungary. Hello, Saba. Then we have Alessandro Lazzari from uh, the Chris Unisalento, but he just joined the F24 Regia in Germany. Actually, Calogero Casilli um, from uh, Ora Zero Group uh, has been appointed in another meeting, so he will not attend. But maybe uh, I saw that uh, Antonio Zilli, uh, Dr. Zilli from the uh, district of the uh, aerospace, technological aerospace, uh, is online. Maybe he will join us. Uh, in this very last minute uh, uh, meeting, but uh, uh, I don't know if uh, he wants, if he is able. Uh, uh, maybe I will start with a very short and fast presentation of the panelists, and then uh, we can. Uh, um, Okay, um, Dr. Zilli can join this table, so I'm very happy. Uh, please, Antonio, if you can switch on the camera, we can see you and see you hello. Say, say hello to you. Hello, ciao, Antonio. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'm Antonio Zilli, and I represent the Distretto Tecnologico Aerospaziale, which is the Apulian Aerospace Technology Cluster. Uh, I'm very happy and I thank to Antonella and the organizers of this event for being here, for participating. I listened a lot of interesting points in, this, uh, first, in the first part. Um, I'm happy to participate in this second section also. Okay, so I will, uh, I, I ask to everyone the, to uh, very briefly introduce itself, and then we'll start with uh, some uh, some questions. Please, uh, uh, you can use the chat uh, from the public to uh, for any questions. Uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll do it in the in the second part of the first presentation. So go ahead. Who wants to start, Vladen? Please. 
Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot to Martin Barrel Cabrun. Sorry, sorry, Martin from the Institute of Secu Security Center and Technology from the Imperial College. Sorry, I really apologize. But uh, no, I, no I, worries. I, I didn't see you. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. It's fine. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, uh, Antonella, just a quick question to you. Can I show just some slides about me and, and my organization really quickly and then use other slides for further communication? Does it work? Yes, it's, uh, it's perfect. If you have any support, you can use it and uh, you are already able to share the screen. So you can see it, right? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vladlian Basisti. I am senior program lead on uh, cybersecurity programs, and I represent U.S. Civilian and Research Foundation, CRDF Global. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for invitation for this event. It's a big honor for me to take part as a panelist and represent uh, my organization. Just like really briefly about me, I have more than 18 years of professional experience working in different programs and projects, mostly in uh, different critical infrastructure sectors of Ukraine, I would say. So it's in health, education, workforce development, ICT, IT, logistics, you know, critical infrastructure protection programs and cybersecurity sectors. Um, if speaking about yeah, it's my background, and I think Antonella can share all this information after this uh, webinar. Um, yeah. Um, our organization work, you know, we are spread it out all, uh, all around the world. Our headquarters, you know, located in Ireland, uh, United States of America, state Virginia. We recently uh, relaunched uh, our office in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and we have all, uh, also office in Amman, Jordan, and our uh, Kiev Ukraine cybersecurity hub. You know, we are doing like uh, mostly our work in cybersecurity protection and critical infrastructure protection programs. Programs. Uh, this is just like briefly about me, and later I will continue like uh, my points you know, during the further discussions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Martin, it's your turn. Uh, all right. So I, I also have some um, slides, but. Um... Sorry, I just like have some difficulties to, you know. OK, so yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. And I was uh, my introduction will be brief and uh, but I have some slides for the discussion. Um, so my name is Martin Barrer. I work at the Institute for Security Science and Technology at Imperial College London. Um, there I am a cybersecurity researcher and uh, I am also a CCHQ fellow um, for national resilience. Uh, essentially my, my background is on cybersecurity and networking and currently I am working, my focus is on cyber physical systems and critical national infrastructure. All right. Okay, Saba. Hello everyone, um, it's a great Honor, honor for being here and thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Chaba Krasnay and I'm currently in Budapest, Hungary, where the weather is nice and very hot, like the topic what we were talking about today. Uh, I'm the head of the Institute of Cybersecurity here at the National here at the National University of Public Service. And a few words about myself and the uh, university. First of all, I'm a PhD in military technology, originally an electrical engineer. So I'm coming from the engineering side, although now I'm working on the soft cyber security, working with diplomacy, working with uh, um, cyber warfare and uh, such theoretical things. Uh, like my university, uh, the University of Public Service is uh, belonging to the prime minister's office, not like the other universities in Hungary. Therefore, we have a very special role here. We are responsible for the education of uh, different um, officers, military, military officers, law enforcement officers, disaster management officers, uh, officers in uh, the secret services, and we are also educating uh, diplomats and educating public servants. And here I'm responsible for everything uh, what is uh, related to cybersecurity, both from research and for education, and of course, cyber physical systems and critical information infrastructures are uh, very special points 
for us both from the research and from the educational side. Thank you very much. The last but not the least, Alessandro Lazzari. Antonio already introduced himself, so uh, I, I... Alessandro. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm moving. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you please confirm yeah, that you hear me? Yeah, please Angela? show us the sea. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, it's uh, it's something I will do later. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, sorry if you saw me moving. Uh, thank you very much for the Unimed Increaser for the invitation. It's a blast to be here with you and to hear from outstanding colleagues. I am Alessandro Lazzari. As Antonella already said, I currently work at F24 AG. That is a, a German company heavily involved in crisis management, incident notification and emergency management and the public alerting. So I decided to move a little bit left of boom while I've been dealing all, all my life with right of boom. So critical infrastructure protection. And uh, in the context of the European program for critical infrastructure protection, within which I worked for you know nine years at the European Commission, and then two years more in deep in KPMG, you know, with operator of essential services. I'm looking forward to you know, contributing to this uh, round table. Back to you, Antonella. Thanks once again for the invitation. Thanks a lot to, to all of you. Well, I would start with the first question and I invite all the other uh, people uh, from this other part of the stage to, uh, to use the, the chat for, uh, for question, uh, for uh, other questions, further questions. So I would start with uh, something which is very clo uh, close to what we already, we have already talked about. So. Um, what challenges do you envision about security and resilience of cyber physical systems from your point of view? So maybe Vladen will start and then we'll, uh, Antonio will start, sorry, and then we'll fo follow the, sa the, the same order of the, present of the single introduction. Yeah, thank you, Antonella. Uh, this is a very interesting point for, for, for us. Uh, I represent an aerospace segment, uh, aerospace industry, which is experiencing in the last uh, 10 years uh, uh, and, um, a, a deep uh, development of the automation and the digitalization of the high crafts. And uh, uh, now we are also seeing uh, the, the drone, the managed aerial system, which are completely dependent on the uh, computers, on softwares, and on signals that they uh, receive from external source, mainly satellite, may, but also from ground, uh, ground system. Moreover, uh, drones are mainly used now as uh, tools to collect information from the ground. That means uh, collecting uh, images, pictures, uh, photos, videos. Uh, and uh, the cybersecurity is a critical capability of these systems because uh, uh, any kind of attacks related, uh, uh, realized toward uh, these, uh, the, the drones, toward the monetary system, uh, became a source of uh, um, a source of risk about the security of the ITM, of the whole airspace, and the safety of persons involved in the operation. Persons directly involved who are then informed about the operation, but also in the very near future uh, about uh, uh, safety of persons that are um, sur uh, surveyed, that are in the road of the drones. So they can be potentially not totally not informed about the presence of the managerial system on the air, um, on the sky. Uh, from this point of view, cybersecurity then is a, uh, a mandatory capability of the applications of the systems. And indeed we are working on that in Puglia. We are realizing some projects regarding the capability to, um, regarding the uh, assessment of the vulnerability of drones. Uh, this project, the main project about that is uh, under the framework of European Space Agency, the ESA, and we are going to complete this project uh, uh, in the very early of next year. We will demonstrate that uh, in collaboration with Leonardo, that is a, a leading partner, leading 
aerospace company, uh, Italian and European one, in collaboration with ENAV, in collaboration with the Telespazio. We are building a infrastructure, technological infrastructure, through which we are uh, able to identify point of penetration and then support um, producers, originally equipment manufacturers, but also uh, operators of a managerial system in uh, improving the, uh, 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 the resiliency to attacks and the capability to respond to the ability then to, to, to uh, uh, be resilient against attacks. So uh, I will be happy to discuss with you in the very early future about this, uh, this uh, capability that we are building in Puglia and in the Grottaglia airport in particular. Okay, thanks, uh, Vlad. And then we'll, we'll have a second round of questions and maybe some comments about what Antonio uh, uh, already introduced. Yeah, I just like uh, want to continue sharing my slides. Can you confirm that you can see it? Yes, we see. Uh, okay, so uh, I would like to speak, you know, from the perspective of Ukraine, what currently, you know, we have challenges, you know, just responding, you know, to your questions about physical and cybersecurity, just like uh, if compare with European Union, with United States, um, with other uh, countries, you know, we are behind because we still doesn't have established uh, critical infrastructure protection agency uh, and system in general, but uh, in our organization, you know, just when we done an assessment and we are working directly with uh, our main stakeholder in Ukraine's National uh, Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. And uh, on the screen, you can see uh, one of our components, which is called uh, Cybersecurity Coordination Cluster. And I know that Alessandro, Antonio, Antonella, you know, already you know, had the chance uh, to participate in our discussions, which is used here in Ukraine as a platform to avoid these like challenges on critical infrastructure, I mean, physical and cybersecurity. It's a, you know, I would call it like poor coordination between state agencies. That is why, you know, we, what we are doing and trying to do here at the national level, it's actually to establish this platform a collaboration and just like you make a connection, which is actually another point of challenge for physical and cybersecurity it's actually a uh, functioning of cyber security and physical security separately you know from each other uh regarding like if speaking about um another a very sensitive point and which we identified in our work for example in ukraine it's a uh, digital culture and education which also was already mentioned during one of the presentation today because as you we all know that uh, human factor actually play a significant role on making cybersecurity attacks uh, possible on difficult on, on different sectors that is why what we actually proposed and i think it uh, it will be uh, i mean useful for you to know as a for representatives of the universities that we developed this basic uh, cybersecurity digital environment um, online training course for uh, university students, I mean, which we implement in Ukraine and we implement also in uh, Moldova and six Western uh, Balkan countries, where we actually increase the awareness of cybersecurity best practices and behavior in internet. Uh, just to continue like this topic, uh, what we seen, you know, from the perspective of awareness and which makes the resilience at the same time of, I mean, aware people, you know, at the critical infrastructure object, at the, at the state sectors, at the universities, uh, you know, we develop uh, a new online cyber hygiene course for uh, governmental officials, which we have already started implemented, uh, implementing for uh, representatives of critical infrastructure from, uh, let's say, uh, recently we had uh, the program start uh, started for Ministry of In Infrastructure of Ukraine, which uh, included more than uh, 90 representatives of critical infrastructure or objects, which is disseminated all over around the Ukraine. This is like just like a basic um, 
information for you what we are doing you know in this uh, aspect of increasing uh, awareness and at the same time improving digital culture and education as for let's say students so for representatives of the government officials as well as we are planning you know to spread it, uh, this uh, course out to the uh, private business companies here in ukraine okay thank you thank you very much uh Saba. uh yep thank you so from our, our, our perspective what i see currently um as a problem uh is this is twofold first of all uh, we are struggling with the skills development we need much more uh guys who are understanding the cyber security issues the second problem is of course legislation um, skills development and legislation so now currently we are working on uh, the field of electricity uh, transportation uh, water and healthcare. so those are the the critical infrastructures what we are uh, currently searching and educating together with our partners and we see that uh, although there are some european legislation in initiatives like the uh, this directive or the proposed NIST 2 directive um, is something good and can be used, maybe uh, can be used very well in Italy or in Germany or in France. Here uh, in a mid-sized European country, we simply uh, don't really have uh, the right amount of professionals who can understand both the, the legislative parts and of course the technical parts. So uh, together with some of our partners on that field, we are uh, trying to develop those um, how can I say, recommendations uh, and those education um, programs that can help the prof professionals to understand what does really mean the, that cyber physical system should be protected from the threats of cyber security and help the legislators to understand that what kind of strategic issues are emerging on that field and how can uh, they solve their problems both from the law enforcement and of course the military perspective. Um, we started a cyber security master program last year uh, at the, uh, from September 2020, which is not a, a traditional cyber security program, I would say, like, uh, like uh, we can see uh, in uh, Uli Salento, for example, uh, but it's kind of a soft cyber program that is designed for those professionals who are working with the engineers and they are not the engineers. Uh, that is designed for those who will uh, do the uh, decision making or have the decision makers to understand the cybersecurity issues. And in this program, we have some uh, special subjects uh, focusing for those uh, critical infrastructures, what I mentioned before, uh, because they have to understand at least the basics uh, of the cyber physical systems and the threats. And I can see that this is very valuable as uh, those um, very talented engineers who are coming to our university, to our master program, who really understand the basics of SCADA ICS systems, simply uh, don't really understand uh, the strategic threats. And uh, right after they, uh, we explain that what could really happen, what is behind those cyber attacks against, for example, a national electricity grid, they, uh, they would say that, okay, we understood, uh, and now we can uh, go back to our professional fields and find something, find some solutions. And drones, were, was, uh, drones were mentioned before. Uh, now we are in the research project related to drones uh, together with our um, faculty of uh, military sciences, military education. And uh, we see that those um, officers who are really deep into the uh, drone and anti-drone uh, thing, they, they don't really understand the threats from the cyberspace. Although, of course, drones are not just physical stuffs that are flying around us, but they are also the part of the cyberspace. Therefore, we are helping them to understand the threats before. And back to the drone part, we see that there are some initiatives to, to, uh, to protect the drones from the threats of cyberspace, but no really um, legislation, national legislation program can be found. So in a nutshell, that is what we are working on currently. Oh, great. Alessandro. You have a very interdisciplinary perspective. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, uh, Antonella. Uh, thanks very much for the valuable contribution from the other colleagues. Uh, 
Uh, I have, to be honest, um, I, I rarely prepare something for the round table because I think it should be really adapted to, you know, what has been discussed. What I can tell you, to, to be honest, from the latest development regarding my, let's say, my engagement at the moment with governments, with operator of essential services, it, both in the protection, in civil protection, and, uh, you know, that spans uh, a little bit in every sector of this very complicated field is this, that I'm trying my best from my side to, uh, when I discuss with someone that is interested in working in, in critical infrastructure protection, cybersecurity, policy making, decision making, uh, promulgation of law, and so on and so forth, to try and... Uh, uh, spend a, an extra effort in, in simplifying the, the domain. Because I see that um, there is a still a lot of countries that need to put in place their national frameworks for the protection of critical infrastructure from all hazards, including the cyber one. I have had the privilege to have a look at the way Italy dealt with the NIS directive implementation, for example, and they find it as a, like a very good, a very good model that um, simplifies the relationship with the operators of essential services, notify them exactly the list of desired requirements that the government wants to be in place to make sure that the operators are abiding, you know, a common set of baseline rules. I'm not saying, you know, that they, are, that they have to secure the space station or, you know, like they have to do, you know, what it's, uh, I don't want even to call it the minimum to, to be secure. They have to put in place those elements that will show that the most important part of the element of the threats are somehow addressed or at the very least perceived. Therefore, uh, investing into governance, investing into monitoring, investing into a maturity assessment. Let me check where I am against a given framework. So providing them a set of measures, not only intended as a protocols or controls, a set of, you know, um, a, a framework from which they can absolutely perceive how distant, how far they are from a current implementation of a given set of, you know, baseline requirements. I find this very powerful. So I'm trying as as far as I'm concerned with the countries that are that I'm discussing with, with the, the operators I'm discussing with, to try and simplify a little bit the thing. And uh, I will make some example. Uh, for governments, I'm strongly suggesting to go for the collaborative model. Among the various uh, experience that can be, you know, uh, that we can look at regarding the critical infrastructure protection and the collaborative model, I could, I could mention, among those, for example, Hungary, for example, Romania. I mean, among the, you know, the, the, the countries that were dealing with this from, you know, a long time, UK with CPNI. So the participative and collaborative model, it's a very good one, I think. It's better than telling to the operators, I have the power, you know, to investigate. I have the power to check into your things. Because, I mean, I think that the public administration should stay public administration. Therefore, a public administration is not requested to understand what it means to operate an industrial control system, a control room, and so on and so forth. Therefore, the public administration shouldn't um, you know, fall into the mistake of trying to control these this kind of matters. But at the same time, then operators need to understand that there is a, a public interest to be strongly defended. This means that the citizen shouldn't be suffering disruption because something has been underestimated. So in case something has been underestimated, hasn't been addressed properly when there were all the possibilities to do it, that is where I think the operators is somehow failing in handling you know, the, you know, the, the, the scenario that they face in terms of challenges, in terms of threats and so on and so forth. Uh, we need... We need, I mean, first of all, everyone always speaks about, you know, circle of trust, but I, I prefer a circle of sympathy because trust is something, it's very important, but sympathy is understanding the role of every single piece of player on the chess, you know, like it's a game of chess and understanding what the role is, how to make it, you know, how to let it unleash the value because certain times we have, uh, we have certain situation in which this uh, is, is, is not happening properly. And one last example would be this. 
I found myself many times in discussing with governments. Sorry if I go at government level, but my expertise is, you know, what I can share is much more valuable at strategic level than a tactical level. But I'd be happy to reply also to tactical question too, is not a problem. Um, uh, I think that um, one of the things I've always asked when I enter into um, whatever discussion with the government, with the, whether this is official or unofficial, whether it is just a consultation, is where is the academia? Uh, I think I'm bringing this in the right, you know, in the right context because we are all, you know, among researchers, professors, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, we are within the UNIMED umbrella here, so I think I can talk about academia. I think some governments are uh, have the crown jewels within the academia, people that understand what is the problem, exactly what the distinguished uh, colleague, colleague from Ontario said, Saba. Sorry if I call you by your name, I, we are part of this field. I see you agree with this. Sometimes government underestimate heavily what they can get from academia. And there is also the scenario in which the academia is not ready to provide it, but the academia has the capability and the possibility to develop it. So to be blunt, the government that goes knock the door or tap on the shoulder of the professor and says, look, we have a problem here. We don't have enough people. Please make sure that in the next semester, you advocate a little bit for us because we need people. You need to get them, even they are not mature. When um, the commission hired me, I wasn't mature enough. I wasn't the guy I am today. Of course, today after 20 years, I'm more experienced than I was there. But the, in those days, I remember I really, I was strongly willing to do something. So to me, motivation and willingness, it's already a good skill set for people to tackle the things of the future. One last thing is, uh, is not uh, you know uh, postgraduate education, but is you know the undergraduate education. We need to introduce security and cybersecurity into school again, or where it's not available, it has to be done. And this is the government to decide these things. Like they were you know teaching me how to properly cross the road, that you need to go on the you know on the stripes. You need to teach these guys to be responsible with technologies because these guys use it just, sorry if I am like very, very like uh, uh, TikTok and Tinder and these things, they expose themselves. And while they do it, they also take pictures of what surrounds them. That when people that are fascinated with social engineering means I'm gonna be in your virtual home in a, like a snap for of a finger, they don't get it. I wasn't getting it. I learned it because I played with Commodore 64 and I understood it. So let this guy be aware. Let's do awareness campaign with them so that they understand. So there is a lot to work. I fully agree with Antonio. I fully agree with Saba. Um, we need people, but we cannot have, uh, you know, Antonellas and Antonios and Sabas in like this. We need to invest. We need to look at these guys and, you know, the code that in their eyes, there is that spark that can make them useful, you know? So that's it, my, the challenges are many. I just wanted to share with you this one. And uh, I thank you very much once again for, you know, for allowing me to speak here among you. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Martin, what's your opinion? Uh yeah, I have some slides if you allow me to share. My, my, my comments on this are maybe more uh, uh, technical rather than, uh, you know, at the government level, but I hope uh, this is useful. So give me a second. I will share uh, my slides somewhere. Okay, this is it. So, yeah. So can you see my slides now? Yes. Yeah, cool. Right. So, um, so one of the things uh, from an abstract perspective I see is that, you know, there are uh, different domain, dim dimensions to, to the problem of security in uh, critical infrastructures. Um, we all know this, but uh, I just want to emphasize the need for uh, integrating these different aspects. So, you know, normally we, we focus on cyber and physical. We cannot forget the human part of um, the issue. And at the intersection of these uh, three dimensions, we, we really need to, to, to find, to search for solutions uh, that 
we can use to protect uh, critical infrastructure. And uh, I made a list uh, regarding the, the subject uh, we are discussing today. Um, as I say, uh, this is a, a bit more technical, but um, most of, of critical infrastructure systems are uh, cyber physical. So we actually uh, really need to find uh, solutions that can fit you know, the conversions between the IT and the OT cultures. It's not only using IT solutions uh, that can be applied in this area. Um, one interesting aspect is that the re replacement cycle of um, you know um, elements in the in the IT environment, for example, an office uh, can be much quicker than in uh, industrial control systems, for example, where systems and machinery can be there for uh, decades. So we also have the problem that uh, these systems uh, should be in operation 24/7. So what happened when we want to actually schedule some um, maintenance um, activities and so on, this is very hard. We cannot just replicate as uh, if we had a computer and have another one, you know, uh, um, duplicate of that computer. This is a uh, physical equipment and machinery and processes. Uh, it's very hard to do. Uh, we also have legacy equipment uh, and machinery. Uh, patching these systems is not really uh, easy. It's not always possible. Uh, we really want to uh, minimize the downtime of these systems. We also have regulations. Uh, sometimes when we modify an operational uh, system, we actually have to go through new checks to be uh, to abide by some uh, uh, laws and, and regulations. So this is an issue. So sometimes uh, we might prefer to leave the systems as they are because otherwise we have to, you know, um, go through the process again and again. Uh, another problem is that this, uh, there are physical components in here that are geographically dispersed. It's not, uh, I just go to some computer and, and fix the problems. Uh, there might be huge distances between these uh, physical components integrated in a whole uh, ecosystem um, of, um, uh, in the context of the critical infrastructure. Then, okay, this is a kind of obvious, but uh, before these systems, used to be uh, isolated to some extent and now we have uh, observed an uh, increased exposure to the internet because at the end of the day the the, the, the introduction of it um, in this kind of systems has uh, enabled uh, scalability and efficiency to you know administrate the systems but on the other hand um, the attack surface uh, has been expanded in a sense and uh, my last point is about criticality analysis and security prior prioritization. This is something uh, we have been working on. Uh, I, I have another slide for this one, but just uh, if, if we discuss about specific works, I have two uh, works uh, I, can, I can tell you in a few minutes, but this is about uh, criticality analysis in the context of these large infrastructures, because normally when we model these systems, we have uh, dozens, hundreds, uh, thousands of components um, tightly coupled, integrated in a system. Uh, so we, uh, our focus is on the analysis of how much um, um, critical are different components and where we should uh, put the focus and the attention in terms of security uh, so we can prioritize uh, different elements. Um, trying to avoid, you know, that a, a cyber attack can affect the, the mission of a system. Um, this is related also to resilience, in the sense that uh, we we want to study um, how how much we can withstand um, cyber attacks to uh, and keep the, the operation of the system, uh, you know, working properly. So um, I don't know how if I have some time. Um, I can just uh, go quickly uh, through two slides. Uh, so the first one is about uh, cyber physical criticality and risk analysis. Um, this particular work uh, we have, uh, we did it with uh, Dimitris uh, who chaired the, the previous session. And it's about um, the focus is on water distribution networks. Um, basically these are very dense networks and we model this this problem as a dependency network with the under graphs. Um, and the, the idea here is to um, derive a metric that can tell us um, 
the minimum effort attack strategy. So essentially what we do is try to understand what are the, the set of components with min minimum effort for an attacker such that if the attacker compromises this minimal set with minimal cost for an attacker, that will disrupt the operation of the system. So we can see that as a metric because um, the higher the, 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 this metric, the higher the effort that an attacker has to make, uh, the better for in, in terms of security. Uh, there is a related work, uh, which is about analyzing mission critical uh, systems. This is more uh, focused on safety. Uh, we took the, the case of um, complex um, aircraft systems. And the idea here is that we want to um, we want to identify the most likely mission critical component set. This is also a metric. And essentially these components have a, um, a probability of failure um, because these are very complex models. That actually the problem of finding this uh, uh, most likely critical set is uh, MP complete. So we have used uh, a logical approach based on maximum satisfiability. Um, we have done a series of um, uh, improvements to get some um, performance and the results are, are, are quite promising so far. This paper has been published uh, recently, actually yesterday, I believe. Um, so the link is there. So, yeah, that's good. Um, right. So this, these were just two examples to show that one of the problems we are uh, interested in is about complexity. Um, and scalability. These are very uh, uh, complex systems. Um, there is also, uh, this is more maybe related to what uh, Antonella um, mentioned before. Um, we, we to do these studies, we really need to generate these models. Um, there is a problem of um, organizational awareness. So maybe sometimes organizations uh, don't really know uh, 100% what they have, what is in operation, what are the assets and so on. Um, the other problem is that we, because we have physical process here and physical laws and so on, it's very hard to uh, produce these models. I guess digital twins might be an answer to this. We can use digital twins to produce uh, models and analyze uh, criticality and risk analysis and so on. Um, I guess we always miss some information in the whole picture. So this is just an idea. How can we manage the, the fact that, that there might be missing points in the picture that can be used to uh, by uh, you know attackers. So can we use some you know zero day perspective, but also for uh, the physical aspects, uh, because these works are actually uh, trying to combine the cyber and the physical. Physical aspects are you know usually relegated. Uh, we mostly focus on on the cyber part. So we I think we have to uh, take. Uh, a unified uh, stance at, at that point. Uh, the other problem is about the inputs, uh, attacker costs and defender costs. Uh, in the context of attack graphs, something I, I have been working on, uh, normally CVSS scores are normally used in the literature. What happens with the, the, at the physical level, how we can measure the, you know, uh, we don't have this kind of C CVSS systems for uh, industrial control systems. Um, another point is that the, what they presented before uh, is more mostly static. Uh, we really need to consider the dynamics, dynamic aspects of uh, of uh, these uh, critical infrastructures. Also, attacker profiles because when you have monitoring systems, if I am, I am an attacker, I might uh, prefer to go for a more uh, complicated exploit and put more efforts as long as I, I can go undetected. So, and these attacks can you know uh, be. Uh, pretty um, long in time and stay there for months. So advanced persistent threats. Uh, so we really need to understand also different uh, profiles for attackers, the expertise and use uh, threat intelligence for this kind of models. And the last point is about um, visualization techniques. Um, this is very hard to do because this is, these are huge systems. So how can we um, use these models to provide minimum, meaningful information for security practitioners so they can quickly understand, okay, uh, I really need to put my attention on this part, uh, fix that, uh, and so on. So to summarize, cybersecurity is essential, but we need uh, really to integrate uh, all aspects, uh, including cyber, physical, and people, and social aspects in the loop. 
in this world, we are focused on cyber physical systems, but uh, um, as I said, uh, the social part and the people, human part is uh, very important. There are many challenges ahead. Uh, all the points I, I mentioned um, require more, um, more work, modeling dynamics, uh, the generation of these models. And uh, as a final point, um, I, I strongly believe uh, all these problems should be addressed uh, using multidisciplinary uh, approaches um, and you know, combined efforts uh, to address these uh, hard security problems. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Martin. I think that you uh, point out several, uh, several challenges and uh, I totally agree with you that the multi-perspective uh, is uh, the, the winning uh, weapon we have. Uh, for con considering the, the, all the challenges uh, around security. Um, uh, I think that uh, the, all the panelists uh, talked about uh, some common points. First of all, the, uh, the necessity of skills development, uh, not only technical, not only soft, but maybe we need again a multidisciplinary approach in order to give the good background to technical people about soft skills, uh, legislation skills, uh, management skills, as Martin pointed out, because uh, cybersecurity is, uh, yes, a technical skill, but it is also a management skill. We can't switch off the, 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 the cybersecurity system for maintenance, but we, it is a, a hot system we must maintain, maintain in when it, it's, it's running. So it's a very uh, hot challenge and it is a management point. I think that uh, the point re um, related to the public, public private constant interaction is fundamental. And uh, uh, again, uh, the, 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 the circle of empathy among the stakeholders, organization can't be neglected. Also, uh, the idea of the civic education is fundamental. Civic, civil education is fundamental. So we need to start from the elementary school with civic education to properly um, uh, educate our children to the proper use of our digital tools, first of all. And, but maybe today, first of all, we should educate uh, parents and then children. So, uh, and then uh, we talked about drones, which, is, which are the new no, tool in the, in the scenario. So um, I, I agree with uh, uh, all the points and I think that are very hot, all hot points, but maybe uh, let me just now uh, uh, propose a second question related to the kind of opportunity and tools you see as uh, people external to this Unimed uh, um, sub-network to collaborate. Uh, maybe you have a, a kind of vision which is different because uh, you stress the, the necessity to create the, a, a strong link between university and uh, external, uh, external partners. So uh, maybe you also have some ideas uh, uh, on how to trigger this, uh, this relationship. So maybe Antonio could start and then we have a, a second uh, um, uh, round of this table. Yeah, I completely agree with your uh, synthesis of the first round. Indeed, uh, we have uh, a lot of stakeholders involved uh, in the uh, aerospace operation of drones. Uh, in the, maybe I, I would like to, to, to stress that which is the infrastructure we are discussing from the aeronautic point of view, that is the ATM, that is the, the, uh, the systems, uh, the ground and aerial operations, uh, technological and operations, so te technology and processes that guarantee the safety of all aircraft operating in their space. 
And um, uh, for sure, you have uh, you have read uh, in these uh, years, and I read just uh, a couple of days ago information about uh, um, uh, presence of drones also in um, uh, in the uh, airport area, which is not hallowed, but persons who are not informed or maybe with some harmful intent. Uh, operate drone in the uh, in near airport where it where uh, uh, commercial aircraft are uh, posed at critical risk. And cybersecurity in this point, this topic, in this point, uh, is very essential because uh, every operator, every pilot on the ground uh, cannot be um, completely sure that uh, link. Uh, is uh, not exploited by attackers for taking the command of the drones. Or uh, let me also stress another point. Uh, drones are mainly used to catch information and uh, from the ground. And the main application now used is for emergency management. That is uh, taking information of a catastrophic event and supporting firefighters or uh, civil protection in order to support uh, ground uh, forces in providing support to, to, to persons uh, uh, in, in hazard. What, what, will, what will happen if the information collected from the drones when sent to the ground as, uh, is attacked by other person, changed? modified, just modifying uh, the uh, GNSS information related to the pictures. Uh, the first, the, the, the first uh, uh, results is that firefighters or any other uh, support emergency operator will send uh, operation, operators in the wrong place uh, without saving anybody and uh, increasing risk for other persons. So in our project, we are studying the cybersecurity of the, of the drones, not only related to the command and control, but also related to the data collected by uh, sensor and payloads. Turning back to your point, regulation. Currently, we have no, a no definitive regulation about how to certify aircraft for, uh, with respect to cybersecurity aspects. And uh, in the very near future, ground, drones will operate in the, in the urban area, collecting information from our houses, looking, potentially looking through our windows or even at uh, uh, high floors. So there is a great, uh, point about regulation from the aeronautic point of view, that is how to certify the uh, security of onboard avionic systems, but how to um, certify that data collected from onboard sensor are secured against any illegal distribution, any illegal attacks, any illegal use, from the operators, but also from attackers, because at this point, the, the, what we are studying mainly is, we are discussing mainly is uh, attacks from uh, operators, from malicious operators who, get, who want to gain information and data uh, from uh, an, authorized, an authorized operation. And so I agree and confirm the thoughts of the aeronautic sector uh, cybersecurity is a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary um, uh, topic in which uh, uh, legal uh, processes, management, and the technology, all of them have to move coordinatedly and in the, the same direction. For sure, uh, operating person, the operators, the pilot, and also the manufacturer as the last responsibility in carrying out the right processes. But uh, in the end, regulation and management of organization need to take into the right consideration, uh, which is the capability of the technology, the current, the tomorrow capability, and the, the, fu the future capability of the technology, and introduce this evolution, this innovation into the regulation in order to also improve the potentiality of the application with uh, this kind of technologies. 
uh, in the end, I, I, I'm very, very uh, convinced that the cybersecurity of uh, uh, aircraft pilot with the pilot, with and without the pilot on board in the near future is um, uh, the very critical technology on board because currently, you know, aircraft fly and a drone fly but we don't know if they are able to, to respond and to sustain attacks. Uh, and for sure, we know that also in the military, I listen some people discussing about military competence, we know for sure that in the military case, we uh, had, we, not to we, in terms of me or by not, even not our for, Italian force, but the US force, Lost some drones because they were attacked through cyber attack, uh, spoofing. Uh, in example, what is that? No, through newspaper, uh, they were spoofed uh, through GNSS. So the 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 the, the drone uh, doesn't recognize where it is and change and maintaining the same uh, procedure uh, landed in the wrong in the wrong place. So it is completely feasible completely feasible in the military and also in the, in the civil context. So this is, I agree. So I agree that the multidisciplinary technology, legal regulation, all of them should be aligned toward the same objective okay. that is the safe air space. Do you think that there are, this is just, uh, um, there are tools or some actions we can uh, put on the table uh, for uh, working together with uh, this UNIMED network? And uh, uh, I think that the, the first point is um, uh, that we need the experimentation. Mm -hmm. So university and any research operator need to contribute to, ex to, to, to experiment the resiliency, uh, vulnerability of aircraft. Uh, because uh, cybersecurity is not uh, a status, but it's a process. So every day change uh, the attacks strategy. And uh, so we need every day to change also the, 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 the capability of the aircraft. So the, the first point I ask to uh, researchers is to contribute with experimentation by, su by supporting the creation of a new attacks, new attacks mm -hmm. strategy. I, I know there are a lot of events connected with uh, uh, attacking uh, uh, some systems uh, and also at the same point, responding, developing, developing services, information uh, uh, code, uh, applications and protocol secure against novel and novel attacks. So this is the contribution of the network you are building, supporting uh, the, com the, 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 the companies in, by ex contributing to experimentation. In the end, this is also my, my business because we are working for building and a test infrastructure. So uh, we are working exactly in this direction and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this, uh, of this network. Okay, Alessandro uh, ra uh, rose uh, his hand, so maybe he wants a, some priority. Yeah, no, no, not just a priority. I don't want to disrespect, uh, you know, the, the other colleagues. I just wanted to intervene because I, I think I can say something that is heavily connected with what Antonio said. I fully agree with every single word you said, Antonio. What I can say in addition is uh, I was kind of, I kind of agree about the certification of the cybersecurity of the drones or and related platforms that allow the control and management on drones, including the air traffic management. On this, I can report directly from the field my perception. Therefore, this will be my, let's say, my, 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 my statement. You don't need to give me the floor again, Antonella. Uh, is that I'm working closely with ENISA on this topic. I am in the ad hoc working group of ENISA for the establishment of the first cybersecurity certification scheme under the Cybersecurity Act. I was already involved since 2014 in the European Commission in the developing the Cybersecurity Act. We need to keep an eye on this regulation. This will be, I am probably the only one calling it like this is, this will be our real cyber shield because these are the rules of engagement for the features we want in our equipment, whatever it is, from a web camera to a smartphone, a smartwatch, 
you know, whatever, also the cooking machine in the kitchen doesn't matter. If there is any cybersecurity involved, if we have a scheme, we have an evaluation that has assurance level. So from kitchen level to nuclear level, you have them in between. You can test also the design. So the, the security by design that it has led to the design of the product, not only the firmware that is bringing you know, on board, but is the way it has been designed, what kind of you know, input by output have been put. If you need all, all of those in a kitchen or in a nuclear installation, it's much, much different. But certain times we have exactly the same product. You just need to disable certain features because they are not needed or they are you know, potential threat in certain environment. So I think we are um, going into the direction of having a, you know, this shield. The first scheme to be launched will be the ICT cybersecurity, it will be the U UCC, the U common criteria. So based on the well-known 15408 ISO standard that has a seven level of assurance. So enough for, you know, every kind of use. I think we should dedicate time in developing some further vertical. There will be a readaptation of the, the ICT general generic scheme to very dedicated and specific environment. Like I see the biomedicals or the aircraft or, you know, there, there is plenty of things. I will close by saying that uh, at the moment, I couldn't, I couldn't really picture myself working in this field. I'm working on a, st in a standardization body to develop cybersecurity risk framework for exoskeleton and exosuits. I thought that we were just watching movies with Iron Man flying around and that was just a movie, but I am concerned when the drones in the, the real meaning of drones will be also walking on the ground. It's not just over, you know, flying over our heads, but we, we would have the robots very soon knocking our door, delivering packages. We need to make sure they are behaving according to the way we want them to behave because I mean, the moment they misbehave, someone can get injured, some property damage may occur or they may tamper with, you know, cables and, uh, you know, pylons, uh, name it and they can do it. So uh, that would be my latest. Um, and sorry, sorry for overcoming, but I thought that, uh, you know, I, I had the hook on, on Antonio, no disrespect for all the other colleagues. Thanks very much, Antonella. Uh, thanks, Alessandro. Thanks also for the, the, the great empathy you create in the panel. <laughs> but, uh, maybe Vladen wants to add something just to, to keep going uh, in, the, in the table. Uh, thank you, Antonella. Definitely, you know, this new topic, uh, drones, would be really interested only and for Ukrainian side. As you know, we have very active conflict in the west, in the eastern part of Ukraine with Russia, where a lot of military mi military drones are used. It's, uh, you know, I'm speaking about the conflict zone, but as we have the hybrid, you know, war with uh, this country, you know, this kind of approach, like using the military uh, um devices you know to, uh, on the i would say on the territories where we have like i would say peaceful you know where we don't have any conflict also has could have a big impact for us so from the perspective where you know it would be possible uh, to have an established good cooperation maybe in like to connect like with U ukrainian university who is uh, involved in this topic also and who could join this network and work with European Union countries on the best practices that have already been used. Speaking about what Alessandro was uh, about uh, state sector, about the academia, it's also very uh, uh, good field of cooperation, you know, with this network and Ukrainian rep representatives. Because at current stage, what is happening in my country, we are at the stage of approving the concept of establishing critical infrastructure protection educational system in Ukraine, with involving cyber defense, defense and cyber security. So as soon as it is signed by the president office, it gives like a big floor for international organizations, you know, from European Union, from US, you know, Canada, other countries actually to step up and help us, you know, to, to train uh, our people to develop the curriculum because a lot has been already developed and we say there is no need to develop a new wheel. We just need to use what and be trained what is already was developed and used, upgrade, you know, the curriculums and just like push it, you know, to the university to start like this work. And 
like in Poland, you know, I think that we will have really good trained professionals only around like seven, 10 years. And I can see really good possible cooperation on this, you know, from, from this network. As for the government, we really need your experience, how you actually establish this contact and make them to believe this is what is uh, currently needed because it's absolutely a big bureaucratical process here and unfortunately you know we came from as independent ukraine from post-soviet union and we still have like 70 percent of this legacy especially in the state sector and this put a lot of burdens and on the implementation of new approaches so i really you know appreciate like being here just like hearing this like really productive discussions innovations and we as organizations here they global really open for future cooperation with universities as i mentioned we work really closely like with universities in us moldova balkans ukraine and so on and we are open you know for, for, for further discussions and further opportunities so maybe Vlad, Vlad, as soon as you go forward with the new training program, the mm -hmm. sub-network could contribute. Absolutely, absolutely. This, this is what you know. I'm speaking about as soon as, for example, new draft law and CIP will go through the second reading in the coming fall in Ukraine, and this training corps concept is adopted and approved it opens the doors you know for international donors organization here to give money to i mean like network like yours other guys you know with experience just to come to us and help us to expedite this process because as i mentioned you know we are in this conflict already for seven years and it's a hybrid and you know drones you know we are you know we are expecting a lot of this stuff happening like uh really soon even like based on what big cyber attacks that we had like last week on our official state offices and internet providers that almost like stop like work in ukraine so as i mentioned and i said yeah please you're welcome and i will let everyone know that you know we have this opportunity and you're welcome to come to us and train ukrainian uh, specialists so for sure we'll circulate this information as soon as you will provide us uh, any opportunity for collaboration. Absolutely. Abba, you have uh, so many things go going on, no? Masters yes. uh, related. Do you think that, um, this is just a, a, a direct question, any opportunity for some joint uh, um, uh, master program or PhD program between uh, our uh, university in the sub network uh, and uh, your your activities. You uh, you are already advanced, no? Uh, from especially for the soft skills. So maybe it can be complemented from the network uh, uh, with uh, some other aspects. Yes, absolutely. So our goal is to, to be the part of as many European cybersecurity related networks as possible. Um, as, and as, as you know, uh, this is not just our goal, but this is also a European goal. As at the end of the, the, the last year, uh, the European Cybersecurity Industrial Technology and Research Competence Center was founded, uh, and it is centered in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, therefore, uh, we really seek on any cooperation under this network that uh, helps us to be part of, of course, the educational networks and the research networks. We started way before uh, this networking stuff uh, of this, this Bucharest Center, as we also part of the European Security and Defense College. Uh, and inside the ESDC, we are part of the, the cyber um, setup uh, of the thing. So we are, we are currently um, have so many programs that is offered for uniformed people all over Europe. We, are, we also developed our cybersecurity master program together with the Tallinn University of Technology. Um, keep in mind their goals and our goals as well. So the personal relationship is also very good all over Europe and uh, we are trying to follow uh, that stuff. I'm also part of a, an ANISA ad hoc working group, uh, which is related to uh, the cyber skills. And I'm trying to, to give my personal experience for the Europeans uh, as well, how to, to involve that kind of soft cyber um, skills 
into the, the European um, security, cyber security educational system. Therefore, um, yes, absolutely, we are open for everything. Uh, we are working together with Antonella in a, uh, an Erasmus project uh, that also aims to 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 elevate the cyber really the cyber security related skills uh, for the the, the European uh, public uh, administration. And we are also working together with some Polish colleagues and Estonian colleagues. And I think that this is the near future um, for the European skills development, working to them, find the, the right partners, uh, build up uh, the circle of trust and circle of sympathy as well. And of course, find the right uh, funds for that uh, cooperate, cooperations and for that programs. And I think that in this uh, period, in this, in this uh, European budget period, we have the best ever opportunity to find the right uh, funds for such cooperations. So yes, go ahead and uh, be part of that uh, networks. Okay, thank you. Martin, you had the Brexit, but you are still for the research part in yeah. the the European Union. Right, okay, uh, so this is the first time I participate in this, uh, in this event, so I, I, I am very happy uh, you invited me. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I can answer uh, regarding that part, collaborations, um, but, um, you know, uh, the KIOS project is a joint collaboration between Imperial and the University of Cyprus. So I guess uh, we work uh, closely with uh, Dimitris and many colleagues in um, Lenos and many colleagues in Cyprus. So um, I guess there is uh, some, you know, space to uh, collaborate. Maybe Dimitris can uh, add something if uh, he wants, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> Regarding that point, Dimitris. Just, just, just uh, Martin, if I can jump in, just to, to comment on this. On, on, uh, on this. Uh, of course, as Martin said, uh, uh, Imperial, and they have a very strong team there in cybersecurity. And we're very lucky to collaborate with them. So essentially, even though they are in the UK, they are also here. And together with Martin, we actually, uh, you know, he's involved also, and he will, be, he will be also more involved in the development of the test beds and the cybersecurity test beds and research infrastructures, which, is, which are things that we can actually use, um, um, I mean, through this Mediterranean, let's say, um, branch. Um, so I, I think uh, through this collaboration, um, Martin's expertise and the groups, their expertise uh, is going to reach the Mediterranean. So it's going to be easier uh, to expand here. Yeah. I agree. In fact, um, if I may, I, uh, there is a point uh, Antonio mentioned about experimentation and data. This is something uh, we are very interested in. So uh, Dimitris actually built a very nice test bed for, uh, sorry, Dimitris, uh, the, uh, water distribution networks. And, uh, you know, uh, there are other test beds uh, at Kios being developed. Um, we as uh, security researchers, we were focused on trying to define, you know, um, a general framework uh, to experiment in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, we found that basically there is a, a common layer where we can, you know, use common stuff for different vertical uh, sectors. But at the end of the day, uh, these different sectors have very specific uh, aspects that somehow must be instantiated for each one of those. So actually, it's, uh, it is a complex, um, uh, you know, project to have an overall cybersecurity testbed. There are common things uh, to that, but uh, I think we, we really need to also um, have the details of each specific sectors. And that uh, comes together with the idea that we really need uh, multidisciplinary collaborations because uh, I am a computer engineer and I'm a researcher, but I, I had no idea about physics, uh, you know, and these kind of things. So I learned a lot with Dimitris and many people in different domains and the results have been amazing because we actually put everything together to, to do cool stuff. Um, so I think uh, we will need to, to collaborate, uh, you know, uh, put together different expertise. Uh, yeah, and then just a quick um, comment on what Alessandro said. Um, I think you're right. Uh, the trustability, uh, how to attribute uh, different behaviors, uh, 
uh, from a legal perspective, it's a, it's a very uh, hard challenge. Uh, it is, it is uh, pretty hard in IoT. So I guess uh, thinking about robots, uh, you know, coming to your door, that's uh, actually more more challenging. Uh, so yeah, um, I agree that there is a there is a a, a huge um, domain for research in that area in the legal area as well. Yeah. Um, Alessandro, you want to? Oh, May I just like yeah, yeah. one quick quick please, announcement. Please. You were asking about the opportunity, so I would like to use this opportunity right now to invite network members to our uh, Ukrainian National Cybersecurity Coordination Cluster, and uh, just announced that on the July 29th we are going to have online event. It's the topic will be cyber biosecurity. So as soon as Antonella, you will share me, me the context of the participants. You know, we will invite ev everyone. You know, for those discussions and just like it's a good platform you know where we have representatives of embassies international organization ukrainian and international universities so i believe that for example in ukraine we have 56 universities who received accreditation on the cyber security so after you know those events they will have an opportunity to connect you directly and discuss possible cooperation between i mean between different universities so i'm inviting you for this event and as soon as i have the contacts you know we will send the invitation to all of you thank you maybe you can send the invitation to martina zipoli and yeah. uh, okay. antonio and uh, we'll forward to uh, all the networks and also to the other participant uh, to this specific uh, um, uh, network um, uh, webinar Yes, so absolutely, everyone, absolutely. We will spread out and broadcast this kind of event. So maybe Alessandro, what do you have in mind for uh, contributing to this network uh, from uh, F24 um, AGF? I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's um, it's for sure that we are liaising with a number of um, entities that are, you know, paying a good attention to the prevention, preparedness, and response, the for crisis management. I mean, uh, I'm here, Antonella, I'm, you know, my availability is, 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 is completely, you know, it's complete because I mean, among the founder of the Greaser and this is one of the milestone of my life. I won't consider a career milestone, but life because when you manage to put together something that achieves something, thanks to Antonio, you and, you know, we found the right moment and the right place to to plant these seeds and this growing. I like it. I mean, uh, I mean, we can be very active in the field of crisis management. We think we still believe that uh, a, a big part of the deal is that uh, I was there where we we learned that you know the the worst of the lesson. No, the EPSIP initially was focusing only on protection of critical infrastructure. But uh, you know, we you know, we know. Everyone knows that no matter how, how many efforts you put together, someone, an anomaly, a cat jumping a fence, will find a way to disrupt our services. Therefore, we need to be resilient. Protection is not enough. So, we need also to to, to be confident with the fact that crises may arise. They are endemic. To what we do, they are endemic to the life cycle of human nature. I mean, also dinosaurs needed the kind of a crisis management. I mean, back then, I think so. We, we, because of the complexity of our society, we have control room, we have crisis room. We need you absolutely need to structure them well. Otherwise, you have a bunch of people that don't know what to do when it's the time to do something. So yeah, with that, we have. I mean, we can definitely provide support, and you know, in project, uh, you know, showing what is the state of the art, what we should achieve, you know, gap analysis, this kind of stuff. That gives the ground for having very solid research and I quote Antonio Zilli experimentation in this field. Uh, thank you, Antonella. Uh, so, I'll have a coffee with you any anyway tomorrow, so we can. You, we can <laughs> we'll have, have a coffee we, tomorrow. We yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have unveiled my plan for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, just yeah. one, I, I use this powerful tool for an opportunity, Martin. If it is possible, please send my greetings and hugs from Italy to Professor Hankin. Which is a great person, and uh, and uh, and you know I've been there at your department, and uh, you know I I truly hope to be there anytime soon again, and uh, have the possibility to meet you in person. Um, 
Thanks. Sorry for using this That's as a great. voice message tool. Yeah. So maybe uh, I, I, I will. I will. Uh, um, I will uh, use these stages to to launch uh, uh, this opportunity. Maybe uh, all the stakeholders outside the network, uh, if uh, can maybe uh, it's like a call for action. If you have uh, idea for an experimentation to involve uh, about technical or also uh, not technical uh, aspects. Uh, the whole network could contribute in some way. So I, I propose to use uh, uh, this, uh, this network for extending knowledge, for creating new network all around Europe. Maybe Martina can add something and maybe she can close uh, this session. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Antonella. I have to say now I, I will... Um shame myself but <clears throat> i have to say the conversation was very interesting but i think i understood really one third of everything you said <laughs> i'm not an expert in the field at all uh so i i was trying to follow up with everything was uh, which was shared uh but i think as antonella said there is a, such a huge potential on uh, on this very first uh, round table and on this very first conversation we had on the, on, on the topic. Uh, so um, I will be glad to follow up uh, with the UNIMED sub, uh, sub network and in general with the work that UNIMED is doing in the region to see what can come next. For sure, we will do as we did for the very first webinar, share the, the presentations, share the recording of the webinar, but most importantly, share each other contacts so that you can reach each other and, sh and, and you know, get along with the conversation and with the inputs which were um, mentioned today. Um, then we can look into opportunities for uh, deepening the, the, the cooperation, whether it is with the Rising Europe, as our director said, or other forms of uh, project and initiatives that we can do together. And last but not least, uh, we can, uh, let's say reproduce this format imagine to have some regular roundtables together some regular moments of exchange uh, together on, on this topic and on other topics related to uh, critical infrastructure so i would like to thank you all thanks to sub network members for being here today and joining the conversation and sharing their experiences from different countries and also share our partners our external stakeholders for joining our work. And uh, please be aware that UNIMED is um, always available to deepen either one or another element of cooperation. Uh, and I want to thank first and foremost, the University of Salento for their availability for starting and commencing this uh, UNIMED subnetwork and for animating every step of the way. Uh, so thank everyone. Uh, it has been a very full, interesting and long morning. I think we all deserve a good lunch. <laughs> and uh, since the summer is coming along, I wish you all good holidays, a good summer break, and uh, hope to get in contact with you all again and often. So goodbye, everyone. Thanks for your time and thanks for all your insights shared with us. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you I very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Goodbye.